<laughs> All right, if everybody can find a seat, we're going to get started. It is 530. All right, we went into recess. Uh, we did not have a s closed session, so we're back from recess. We're now in presentations. It is 5.30. We're reconvening the city council meeting, and our uh, presentation tonight is from Mission Springs Water District. Our general, The general manager from the water district, Arden Wallen, will be given a presentation on the water district. I see his PowerPoint up. It is all yours, sir. We've got 30 minutes. Take your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor and distinguished councilman council people. Uh, congratulations to Vaughn and Anayela. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I have my board members here. Uh, some of them, I have Nancy Wright, the president of my board, uh, and uh, Jeff Bowman, and John Furby. And uh, the others could not be here, uh, but um, thank you so much. Um, Tonight, we're gonna to try to give you a very brief presentation about a subject that is normally, excuse me, I think I need to get this up here a little more. Sorry, it's what you get for being six foot four. Um, it's, an, it's a subject that's very interesting to microbiologists, chemists, engineers, uh, and, but I don't know how interesting it is to the most people. But uh, we're gonna to talk to you today about wastewater treatment and the city's, or excuse me, the, the, the city's involvement with uh, the district's plans to move forward with uh, uh, what we refer to as the Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant. And the biggest challenge today was to take all of the information, we've been working on this, as you'll see, for the last two decades, essentially, and we've got to, we tried to hone the information all down to what we think is relevant to the city of De uh, Desert Hot Springs, okay? Um, with that said, uh, we will try to today give you a rationale, project rationale, uh, give you uh, a history because you need to understand how this has evolved. Many of you have been around for the, the whole time. Uh, a project description, uh, what we think are the benefits of this regional wastewater treatment plant, and then we conclude with the status, uh, and then I'll, I'll open it up to some questions. Um, to begin with, um, in the rationale, I've, I've, I've brought it down to two components. First of all, uh, let's, let me start with the fact that we have been uh, hearing and have been contacted by the business people in that area we have sensed that there is a uh, increased economic interest in development in the Indian I-10 area. Um, and in fact, we started meeting with uh, uh, not only the des Desert Hot Springs, but also Palm Springs and the county uh, people several years back. Um, but the uh, another issue that comes into play is their flows to our uh, plants have increased. Presently, the district has two treatment plants. We refer to one as the uh, Desert Crest plant, which is a small plant, and, and my, my pointer doesn't work, but it's to the south and east. Now, you, if for everyone in the audience, this is a, uh, a, a picture of our groundwater protection project. The only areas left to sewer are the blue areas. So we have sewered most of the other areas in our project. The Desert Crest plant is clear to the bottom and right, and then up in the center and up a bit is what we re refer to as our Horton wastewater treatment plant. The combined capacity of those two plants is about two million gallons a day. Now we have been, like I said, very successful in moving forward with our groundwater protection project. Our goal was to sewer 7,912 parcels, nearly 8,000 parcels. It was a project that was running around $70 million. Uh, we have provided sewers to date to 4,693 parcels, almost 4,700 parcels, leaving only a little over 3,000 parcels left to sewer. But that has increased the flows to our plant, which are 
we are not we are not exceeding the capacity of our plant, but we are where, where we are is at what we call a maintenance barrier, and we have certain trains that we need to operate. So it is we are at a point where we need to start looking at additional treatment before we move forward with the other 3,000 uh, uh, parcels. So let's move on to give you a project history here. Uh, I mentioned a little earlier that we've been working on this for nearly two decades. Uh, we purchased 90 acres back in 1995. That's what, uh, that goes to show you how far back this is, this is gone. Uh, we commissioned uh, two studies, one by URS, they performed a uh, wastewater master plan. Most districts like ours have a master plan, at least most well-run districts like ours have a master plan. It it's, a, it's an expensive plan, it goes through the entire facilities and it projects what we need. The plan costs nearly $300,000, of which we got a grant to write, incidentally. We also have one for the water side. But I felt a bit concerned back in 2008 uh, with regard to at what point do I stop taking my flows to the existing Horton wastewater treatment plant and start sending them to the regional plant. So I commissioned a study with a group called Tetratech to do what we would call a, a, a strategic comprehensive facilities plan. And it sounds a little weird, but at that point they took and looked at this and said, you can start to move sewage down to that area probably as soon as you can. And we look at it to see at what point do we quit expanding, because expanding at the Horton plant is gonna cost us nearly, what did we think, Danny, 18 million? So we don't wanna make that expenditure unless we're sure it's the right direction to go. So we, did, so we move forward with that. We get all this done, and along comes that wonderful recession that we just experienced. We saw our flows decrease by 40%. Um, and interestingly enough, however, our flows to the wastewater plant didn't go down that much, which meant that our cost remained the same. So we needed to keep moving on that, on that, on that front. Um, now we're starting to see economic development increasing, or the interest increasing again in the Indian and I-10 area. Um, we've met with the city of Palm Springs, we've met with Desert Hot Springs, we've met with the county, and local businesses have, have approached us. And frankly, we have been working with them. We commissioned another study with Webb to do a preliminary engineering design so we could start the formation of what we call a community facilities district in that area. Uh, and in addition to all of that, about two years ago, did we find out that the Regional Water Quality Control Board had determined that there was a threat of nitrogen contamination in that area. So they now require additional treatment for anybody that wants to develop in that area and are going to build their own individual sewage treatment plant, which makes sewering the area even more feasible. So we move forward uh, with this project thinking that you know, it's time to, it's time to get going. Um, so, let me describe to you what this project entails. Um, first of all, it has many components. Uh, there, you'll have the actual treatment system, which will, we plan, will be around uh, one million gallons a day. Then we need to find a way to move sewage from our existing system down to that plant. That conveyance is what we call the regional wastewater treatment plant conveyance line. It's an interceptor. We think that like the plan is around 17 million. The, the conveyance is around three to four million. And then we also are looking into the collection system that we would have to develop in the Indian and I-10 area, which will have to be funded by a community facilities district. Um, the benefits are, you know, uh, uh, great, we think that the, the plant in this area, and let me show what, you, you can look at this, uh, 
particular area here, I don't have a pointer for those of you who want to look at it, but if you look at the, at the, the uh, uh, pictorial here, you can see where the Horton plan is. We bring sewage down to the area through the brown area there, and all of that brown and that pink area, the pink area is not uh, sewered yet, but we take that and put it in a lift station and that brings it back up to Horton. When we get ready to build the regional plant, we will not use that lift station. We will send that sewage to the uh, west on Dillon and then south on Little Morongo to the blue area, which is the location of the uh, uh, regional wastewater treatment plant. All right, thanks, Vanna. Uh, he said it, not me. Okay, and if you look at, now Jeff, you see where the blue line is and west would be the area where we will have the collection system for the Indian I-10 area. And those are sep basically separate projects that will need to be constructed. Now, uh, why are we doing this? Because we're talking a lot of money here. When you look at both projects individually, uh, expanding at the Horton plant was around 18 million. Expanding just in the Indian I-10 area with this, the two flows separated was around 21 and a half million. Uh, and basically it was difficult for us to convince the uh, business owners in the Indian I-10 area to really support a project of that size. The collection system seemed to be doable, but the treatment system seemed to be the, the, the point at which we needed to find another way uh, to do this project. So building the regional plant made some, made some, uh, made some sense to us. Um, it, it allows for regional collaboration, and like I said, um, we're not only working with Desert Hot Springs in this effort, but we're also working with Palm Springs, and we're also working with the county. Um, and there's in economic incentives. Now I've skipped to the last point here of moving to this because the last thing that I want to mention is um, Director Wright and I were invited to a governor's uh, committee to participate in a discussion where we looked at land use and water management uh, coordination uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a point where they were looking for projects in which they could see those two cooperating with each other. We really didn't think of much, did we, Nancy, that day until we brought up this project. The governor's office thought it was great. So that immediately gave us the support at the state level for what I'm gonna to refer to here uh, next is, as funding opportunities. And to have the fact that we are gonna use a water management project to help enhance the land use in that area is going to be something that's gonna be, uh, I think, very helpful for us when we're out there looking for funding sources. So, um, the thing that we wanna go into now is what is the status of this project? And that is basically, um, it comes down to we're looking for funding sources. And by locating this plant where we are going to locate it, it has opened up the opportunity for uh, more funding than we would have available to us if we were to separate the plants. In fact, if one, one program we are looking into is just recently, uh, was just recently created through Proposition 1, it's called a Small Community Severely Disadvantaged uh, Program. We structured the project so that we would meet the requirements of that grant to the, to the letter. By doing that, we have opened up the opportunity to get $8 million in grant funding. By having the plant there, we have the opportunity to also get the, the, the community facilities district through because we've taken that component out. Otherwise, we would have had to come up with $10 million for that particular area. And it wasn't, it just wasn't, or it didn't seem like that was going to be accomplished. Um, we are in the process of completing the uh, request for proposals to do both the, the design and the environmental work. 
Um, and I already have uh, told you that we've done the preliminary engineering work. We have the, the infrastructure laid out for the collection system. Um, and my, I think my conclusion would be, and then I'll open it up for questions, is that what the board has done in their commitment to this and to, and to work with the City of Desert Hot Springs and Palm Springs and, and the county is that we have factored in the cost of this plant into our cost of, into our cost of service analysis, which means that, and we will be starting a 218 process here um, soon in which we're gonna look at a slight change in our rates, but if we fail to accomplish that slight change in our rates, then our funding for this project is gonna be um, jeopardized. So we would ask for your support <laughs> in that move because the board has said, regardless of whether I have this eight to $15 million in potential funding that I can get through grants, we also, we want to be sure that this project moves forward so they have factored it into their capital investments which went into the cost of service analysis. And did I leave anything out? Yeah. What I will do... Pardon me? Oh yeah, well, it's, it would be illegal. You know, and it's the same issue that we have with the groundwater protection project. We need to go out and find other sources of revenue. So did I meet the time frame here? Yeah, Pretty you're quickly? you're doing well, Arden. Um, okay, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. Great, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I'll start off with a couple comments. Um, we, as a city, believe that our economic development strategies that we're gonna put forth are gonna help build on the industrial areas out there. But they all have the same problem as you do, is getting their wastewater treatment somewhere, <laughs> or getting their wastewater to somewhere to be treated. Um, it's not cost effective for a million square feet of industrial retail space or industrial commercial space to put a packaging plant on site. Um, so it, it's tough. Uh, we as a city want to partner with you and do whatever we can uh, to assist in what, wherever we can to help with this process because it's only going to benefit us in the future. Um, I'm sure I might have a few more comments, but I'm going to open up to the council members. Council Member Parks? Yes. Um, we can't do anything down there without sewers. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get the water down there. Um, and. It seems to me that we could sell these landowners on an assessment district because without water, without sewer, their property will never get any more value than it is today. So if you can, you know, it would mean selling them on the idea if you want, and, and I know that most of this property is probably 10 generations from the original purchaser of the property. And they have in their mind this huge rainfall. Investment. Yeah, yeah, investment. But um, without water and sewer, that investment is not worth anything. So when are we going to, how can we get that ball rolling? Right. Because I know it's got to go somewhere. So that's the first thing is the water treatment, the wastewater treatment plant. But the second is before we can develop or do anything down there, we need well, sewers and water. Yes, as you know, you know, working with these individuals is relatively easier than in other cases because they are business people. They understand what this means to them, and they and they're excited about doing this. We think that by bringing the treatment system to that area um, and and using that capacity to treat some of our existing flows. Uh, helping us to offset some of the cost is a is is a reasonable option, and it also uh, provides incentive for them to move forward. Um, you know, we we do plan on having this hopefully plant built by the uh, by the end of 2018, and there are a number of different components to it, and especially if we are going to uh, uh, comply with some of the conditions for grant funding, especially this Prop One funding. We can throw that into the mix. Uh, wow, we, we can make this thing happen. We want to move this thing along as quickly as possible. They're fairly receptive to the end of 2018. That's within their planning horizon. If we can get that thing 
if we can get that plan in by that time. Who are they? The property owners down there. I don't think they, they're reasonable people. They're smart people. They realize this isn't going to get done overnight. And I also want to share with you that the Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, has been very receptive to this um, effort too and they're they're very supportive of our putting the plant there and so if we get to the point where we're moving in that direction I think they're going to be um, they're, they're going to work with all of the development down there to uh, you know to be to, to make sure they're in compliance until we do get the plant built Councilwoman Zavala do you have any questions or comments well, I I think it's a great first start. And uh, my question is regarding the grant. Uh, when does the application process open? And do you know by when you would know if you receive the grant? Well, the, 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 the process has already um, opened up. We've already um, met with the, um, uh, a member of the State Water Resources Control Board. They're very excited about the project. We structured it so that it would it would meet the conditions of that particular uh, small communities grant program. And there are some conditions that they have with that program uh, that the staff originally said, no, we need to, you know, you need to go to the board if you want to, you know, or any special consideration, and we did. And then the fact that we, that we uh, got, have the blessing of the uh, governor's office in the land use uh, or um, um, efforts, those two then communicated with each other and they have gotten back to us that they really do like this project. But we, we are now have to make this thing work. We have the FAST somewhat completed and we've talked to Mike today about finishing it, about 50%. The application process But we will have it in. And uh, it's a brand new program. If you remember, you, you passed that in 2014, Prop 1. So this is a, a new program. I, I can't remember, I think the, the first round they have around, I think there's around 40 million. I don't recall. There's a, there's a, a large sum of money in there for that. Not only that, but by locating this plant in that area, uh, we also have um, increased our opportunities and put us in, a, in a, a proximity that is ideal for reuse. And the drought and, and the mayor's directive that we need to do everything we can to prevent the uh, drought from occurring in the future. And reuse is one of those options that we're looking at. And there's a huge, there's about a billion dollars in that um, seven and a half billion dollar a proposition just for reuse and not many disadvantaged communities are set up like we are to, to, to apply for reuse programs. But that will have to be a second part of this expansion. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Director, reflect that Mr. Betts is present. Did you have any questions? <laughs> Okay, with that said, I appreciate uh, you being here today. And again, we'll build a partnership uh, with the council and you obviously work well with our city manager. Anything we can do. I did take a tour with a, uh, a small contingent of uh, people in the community yesterday of the North Palm Springs uh, industrial area on a manufacturer that is manufacturing uh, some sort of building materials. He's used up all the space that they have there, and it, because of the expansion that he'll be taking, he's going to move most of his, his uh, business down to San Diego to be closer to the ports, but he does want to expand here in that area. Their issues are wastewater treatment. So. Uh, good. <laughs> um, I, and, and I want to say something else, too, is that I, I've been working with Martine in this. Mr. Magana has been stellar, and I really love working with him. So. My congratulations on, you know, having a, a, a top-notch team there on that. But, and there's one last thing I'd like to say, just as a point of clarification. I think um, Desert, there, there seems to be a confusion about this second agency, this water agency. Uh, and it was mentioned during the forums, and the reference was to Desert Water Agency. The water district in that area is not Desert Water Agency. In fact, we share 
no infrastructure boundaries with Desert Water Agency, even though they're our vendor, they're our, our state contractor. Um, the facilities to the south there are in Coachella Valley Water District's uh, area. Just a point of interest. You don't share any boundaries when it comes to the delivery Pipes of water, delivery, yeah. that type in of fact, stuff. We as voters share the boundaries there, right. because they are the state contractor contractor for water that's true it's very confusing but if you're really bored one night you can sit up and read both their websites and if figure you need all to go out. to sleep <laughs> thank you i, so I appreciate much. Uh, all the board members for coming out thank you very much thank you again arden for your presentation and we'll be talking more in study sessions and where we can help each other thank you again uh, for right now we have five minutes before the general meeting starts so we'll take a recess for five minutes Excuse me, sir, he needs to take my picture.
Okay, Larry, how are you? I'm going to start the meeting. We do. If everybody can find a seat, we're going to get our meeting started. We're going to get the meeting started. If you can find a seat. That was just presentations. Have a good meeting. Thanks. All right, before we get the meeting started, a couple announcements. Um, this is a new process that we're going to try to see if we can move things along. On the speaker cards, if you came in to speak on public comments, not an item, you're more than welcome to fill out a speaker card and give it to the city clerk. Uh, we'll announce during public comments how that process works. If there's an item on the agenda that you plan to speak on, we will take public comment after we open that item. You do not have to fill out a speaker card. Please state your name when you come forth. We'd like you to state your address or your, your city of uh, residence also if you can, don't have to, um, but you do need to state your name for the record. And there won't be a speaker card that you, you have to fill out for that item. But if you are speaking in public comments on general issues regarding the city that aren't on the agenda, you do need to fill that out. Also, please check your cell phones and make sure they're off so they don't disrupt the meeting. And at this time, we will call the meeting to order for the regular meeting of the City Council and the City Council serving as a successor agency to the Redevelopment Agency Board for December 15th, 2015 at 6 p.m. here at the Carl May Center. Roll call, please. Councilmember Betts. Present. Councilmember Parks. Here. Councilmember Zavala. Here. Councilmember McKee. Mayor Mattis. Present. I'd also like to take a motion to uh, excuse Council Mayor Pro Tem McKee, who's traveling on the city's behalf to China for an economic development uh, trip. It's uh, motion has been made. Is it seconded? Uh, please vote. Mayor Pro Tem is excused from this meeting. Uh, we're going to have the invocation, and our invocation tonight is going to be given by Reverend Bruce Montgomery. I would like everybody to stand, and after the invocation, we'll be taking a moment of silence for the tragic act of violence that took the lives of innocent people in a horrific terrorist attack on Wednesday, December 2nd, 2015, in San Bernardino. After we take that moment of silence, uh, Councilwoman Zavala will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll, we'll I'm Pastor Bruce Montgomery. I'd like to express our appreciation to once more being invited as the ministers of this community to open City Council with an invocation. Um, Mayor Scott Mattis has asked that the Desert Hot Springs Christian Ministerial Fellowship would uh, coordinate who gives the invocation. So if you would like to be in the rotation, please contact either myself or Reverend Paul Miller. And we also welcome those who might be Hispanic or of any other ethnicity to come and give the invocation in their own language. It does not have to be in English. I want to begin tonight with the words in which Jewish prayers begin. So let us pray. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe. Most great and gracious God, you who are most worthy of praise, tonight we humbly acknowledge our need for you and our every endeavor. Lord, we ask that you would bless our mayor, our council members, individually and corporately. Give them the wisdom, the physical strength, the emotional energy, the mental clarity, the creativity, and the humility necessary to work together for the good of all of us who call Desert Hot Springs home. I also pray for the city staff who implement the decisions made by the council and our police and fire departments who protect us. And they can't do it alone. It takes all of us working together. So I pray for a spirit of cooperation and enthusiasm on the part of all our business and civic leaders and ordinary citizens as we strive together to accomplish the common goal of making Desert Hot Springs an ever increasingly better place to live. 
en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Amen. And now a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Now with the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We will now move on to the city attorney's report. There was no closed session tonight, so he'll be reporting on the December 1st meeting only. Uh, Mr. Mayor, there was no reportable action taken at the December 1st, 2015 closed session. Thank you very much. Motion to approve the agenda. On our approval of the agenda as written, so that I'm just going through the motion so the public can uh, understand also. In the approval of our agenda, we will be approving the consent calendar. Any items from the consent calendar that you would like to pull would be a part of your motion at this time. Is there any consent items that would like to be pulled? We have item 10, 11, 12, and 13. Here of any, Mr. Betts, would you like to? Motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve. And do we have a second? Um, I just wanted to. Your microphone, please. That microphone, please. Thank you. Okay, at this time or later, do we indicate that um, item number one in public hearing is going to be continued? Item one in public, uh, item number one is a public hearing and it uh, has to, we still have to open the public hearing before okay. we continue it. Okay, so also, we have six, seven, and eight. Also, items six, seven, and eight, there was a request by staff. Do you want to, uh, Rich Malakoff, do you want to make that request? For item one? Uh, was it Rich or I'm sorry, was it uh, City Attorney? But Mr. Mayor, on item one, that should be continued to January 19th, not the 5th. Okay, item one, we're going to open the public hearing before continuing it. So we'll do that at that time. Item six, seven, and eight, there was discussion by staff today that the applicants wanted that I, those items continued also. Is that correct or not correct? That's correct. Okay, so at this time during the motion, would that be proper to add that in? I, I want to discuss them, so my motion is to approve the agenda. Can you put on your mic, please? No one can hear you. My motion. Your mic's still not on. Thank you. My motion's to approve the agenda as it is, and can we continue those items when we get to them. I'd like to have some discussion on each one of those, not just dispense with them now. Okay. Then your motion is to approve the agenda as is. I will be asking that item five be moved before public hearings as the consultants that are here do have to catch a plane. Um, so I'll be moving that item before public hearings after mayor and council member comments. That works. Is there a second on Mr. Betts' motion? Is there a second? No second, motion fails. Do I have another motion? Yes, I'd like to move the agenda. Um, continuing items six, seven, and eight. And the consent, consent calendar as is. Six, seven, eight would be moved to uh, the f January 5th meeting. Is there a second on that motion? And this is, this was um, as requested by staff. Correct. Uh, there's backwards there, but that works. Just, Please. Discussion. Yes. Okay, so why aren't we having some time for discussion on those items? Well, how are we going to, uh, I think part of this discussion is over the, um, the amount of the fee. Correct. And at the last council meeting, we asked staff to come back with some type of fee contained in the development agreement. And we had all gotten some communication about the, the uh, fee amount. And uh, there may be some objection out there. How are we gonna communicate to city staff what we want to see on that? Whether we want to have a fee at all, no fee, the fee amount. Last meeting it was 20,000. This meeting it's gonna be nothing. How are they gonna get any direction from us? May I comment on that? Yes, you may. 
I think the best thing to do is have it in a study session. If you'd come to the three o'clock study session, okay, we, but, we, we but can that discuss it. Answer, that doesn't answer my How's, So we're gonna wait until, so you're continuing these till when? E each of these three projects have been approved um, for development. They have not been approved in the regulatory permits. There's time to do that. And the email that was sent out by our city attorney, I'll let him speak to that today. Yeah, we actually received requests from the three applicants for the medical marijuana cultivation facilities listed as items six, seven, and eight to continue this matter. And the primary concern has to do with the mitigation impact fee that we currently have set at $150,000 per development agreement. So, so you're gonna have that a study session over only the fee amount? After the city attorney and city manager meets with the individuals that have an issue with it, they might request a study session and or action be taken at the next council meeting. So they're gonna come back with a different amount but without city council input, we may be at the same place we're at now. I, I don't know at this point, but you could have a one-on-one -on -one with the city attorney or city manager and, and voice your opinions on those, I, I would assume. Or Mr. Mayor, an alternative is to appoint a subcommittee to sit in on these discussions from the city council. Yeah. I was going to speak with the city attorney and city manager on that and see if that was something they wanted to do after this meeting, but uh, it's a good suggestion. Okay, anyhow, let's vote. Okay. <laughs> There's no other comments? Please well, vote. No. Yes, what's your comment? I still think we all need to make input, and I think the best way is through a study session, and then I'll end it at that. And, uh, is it possible to have a study session on uh, items two and three as well, since it's related? Um, can you explain the difference in these? Yeah, the development agreements, the three items six, seven, and eight, those were presented at a public hearing the last time, but the council took action with direction just to work on those on that particular mitigation impact fee amount. Um, the, the two that are being presented to you tonight are being presented to you for the first time to consider the development agreement. I believe those applicants are here tonight and there might be a request for a continuance of those two items as well. Uh, because they're public sure. hearing items and they're posted, I still have to open the public hearing and we have to That's get to correct. that request. So we can't continue those as of now. Any other comments? Please vote. All right. Uh, Mr. City Clerk. Motion passes with Council Member Betts opposed. Thank you. Uh, public comments. Uh, at this time, pursuant to the Brown Act, any person making, uh, may comment on matters of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council not listed on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the City Council shall not take action on or discuss matters raised during public comment portion of the agenda that are not listed on the agenda. Uh, comments are limited to the first 10 speakers or 30 minutes. I will time. If we, some speakers do finish early, I will continue. We do have 16 speakers tonight. If it goes to full 10, full 30 minutes, those six speakers will be moved to the end of the meeting. Uh, if you haven't submitted a blue card, they are in the back. And with that said, there was one other item. We'll start with our public speakers. Judy Shea. Oh, your time is on the big screens around here. It is your responsibility to watch your time, and as it ends, I will ask the next speaker to come up. Uh, Wayne Weyerbach, you are to follow Judy. Good evening, City Council staff, wonderful staff and City Council. Um, the um, things I'd like to talk to, oh, Judy Shea, and I'm Desert Hot Springs resident since 1991. I checked today uh, and I called three times for the COD campus satellite issue. Okay, we all, a whole bunch of us filled out the surveys and to date they keep putting me off saying they don't have any resolution, they don't have any status. And I'm like, well, it's about time. January 15th is the next COD board meeting. And I think some of us should show up and say enough's enough, you've had 10 years You've got probably $250 million sitting in the, I mean, no, I'm sorry, you got $80 million left out of $349 million. And we need to have some action on this end of the valley. You know, we need that campus. We need a COD campus yesterday. We need it for the kids, and we need vocational training as well. Um, I just got an offer today from uh, Grid Alternatives that they'll go ahead and teach our kids over, hope maybe at the Rising Star Academy, to do solar. 
uh, I've been working with Grid Academy, uh, Rising Star Academy, to try to boost up what they're doing. And I took them to a, a meeting yesterday with the school districts. Uh, it's called Network North. And uh, that was very receptive. Um, okay. BFC program. I addressed to the board of directors for uh, Palm Springs Unified School District, since they got $40 million, why can't they implement the Betty Ford Center program in our school districts? Right now, one out of every five child is damaged by addiction. We need to get some help, especially since we have all this other stuff going on with cultivation and so on and so forth. Um, Roy's Research Center, I hope someday we'll have the money that we're supposed to be chipping in for the homeless project and get that going as a 24-hour facility instead of a 12. Now, I think we're putting the cart before the horse when it comes to this whole wage thing. I believe that we need the jobs. If we get the facility here, we can hammer whoever it is who owns these and the franchise to pay a decent wage. But if we don't, we're, we're talking about something pie in the sky. We don't even have it here. If we had the 300 jobs here, we might say to them, yeah, we want 10 bucks an hour and we're getting it in January. It's 2011, we're gonna get 11. And in 2000, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the next year we're gonna get 11 and the year after that, 12. And uh, I really think I'm not against what everybody else, just because I'm sitting on this side of the room, um, I want a fair wage for everybody, but that's fair and equal across the board. I don't want the girl sitting down there at a bank making $9 an hour. I want her to be making the 15 someday. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Wayne Weyerbach, followed by Maria Martinez. Good evening, Mayor Matus, members of City Council and staff. Uh, my name is Wayne Weyerbach. I am a resident of Desert Hot Springs, and I just want to update um, the council on um, the CERT activity in the community. The um, Emergency Preparedness CERT Committee, our next meeting will be January 28th, 6.30 p.m. at Christ Lutheran Church, and everyone is, a, is invited to attend, um, and hope to see more people there. Um, the County of Riverside Emergency Management Department is going to be conducting a new CERT flood response class in preparation for the impending El Nino. Um, this is an advanced training class for anyone who is already CERT trained. Um, if you're not CERT trained, this is um, something not for you at this time. It's something only for those who have had the initial CERT training. Um, all those who participate in the training um, need to bring their own personal protective gear with them um, to the class, and there are two upcoming classes. Uh, the the uh, first one is in the West County region, and that'll be this Saturday, December the 19th, 9 to 12, at the Ben Clark Training Center in Riverside. Uh, the second one is East County area, which will be Saturday, January 9th also. Um, they're both from 9 a.m. to 12. And the second in the East County will be at the Riverside County, East County Emergency Operations Facility in Indio. I have some informational flyers in the back for the, um, any members of council as well as the public. Um, there is an online registration only for this. Um, the links are quite lengthy, so um, just send me an email and I will email anyone who's interested in attending these classes the link to register. And register the sooner the better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Martinez, followed by Denise Barlag. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es María Martínez y vengo de aquí de, de Capiro City. Mi historia es esta, este, estuve trabajando en Walma de Palm Spring y me despidieron por unas injusticias. Tengo, soy madre de, de seis hijos y 14 nietos. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is María Zavala. Maria Martinez, and um, I have a story to share. Um, I was fired from our, uh, from Walmart, and um, she continues. I will be paraphrasing, as I'm not a professional translator. Sure. For your info. Estuve trabajando en Walmart más de nueve años. Me faltaban solo diez meses para jubilarme cuando este me despidieron por unas injusticias. Este. He querido a regresar a mi trabajo, pero solo regreso a mi trabajo pagándome lo, lo, el salario mínimo, mínimo. Y no es justo por eso, por eso necesito de, que si regreso paguen un salario justo. 
Este. I was one of the workers that was uh, that was fired uh, and just and it was uh, that I was fired without uh, any justification. I have children and I have many um, grandchildren as well, and I have been uh, I have been working to get back to go back to our to Walmart, <coughs> but the live, the wage is not a uh, living wage. También la historia que tengo es de que a mi madre me la detectaron de cáncer terminal. Entonces, este, todo eso me ha afectado a mí y he querido regresar a mi trabajo y hasta ahorita no, no me han regresado a mi trabajo. Entonces, también me estoy dando cuenta que aquí quieren hacer una gualma pagando el salario mínimo. Eso nos, nos, nos afectaría a muchas familias, tanto tanto las familias de aquí como las de Palm Springs. Se necesita de que ganemos un salario justo y seguir adelante en la lucha. Gracias y es todo lo que les tengo que decir. Another, another reason why I haven't returned to Walmart is because my mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh, aside of that, I want to say that I heard recently that you guys are bringing a Walmart to this community. And I don't think that will benefit the working class families. In fact, it will be hurting the families that are working and struggling. Thank you, that's all I have to yep. say. Thank you. Next speaker is Denise Barlag, followed by Melissa Rodriguez. Denise, I, I hope I got your name right, and I apologize if I didn't. Close, Barlage, but thank you. Hi, I'm Denise Barlage. I was from the Pico Rivera store in Los Angeles, California, one of the many workers that was laid off. I was there nine years, five years also organizing and speaking up to make change for all workers. Uh, you know, 530 workers weren't laid off, 530 families were affected by that. Uh, it was de de very detrimental, and eventually the city uh, mayor and various city officials jumped on board, realizing the mistake that Walmart had made. You know, the library closed an extra day regarding that laid off. Many companies suffered equally in that area, because why? Walmart is a trendsetter. If Walmart were to come in to Desert Hot Springs, and initially you guys state that they have to pay a living wage now, with 70% of their workload being full time, with reinstatement of benefits, the effect will be generally graded in Desert Hot Springs because it'll just generate more sales and more productivity. You won't have workers on government assistance. You'll have productivity in your city. You'll have a rotation of that economy because of that living wage. So you need to think about that if you're gonna let the largest private employer in your city, what it's gonna do. Is it gonna benefit or destroy and dismantle good workmanship in your city. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Rodriguez followed by Lorraine Salas. As the residents from Desert Hot Springs, this is my story. One of my children was working for Walmart in the east end of the valley, who was hired full time within 60 days. His hours were cut part-time and released from work when he spoke up. My other child, who is a Marine Reservist, is working in the West area. The mistreatment to them and others continues. For example, the schedule is come in late and report in early <coughs> the next day. The pay, the pay earned are poverty wages. The injuries are not reported. The scrutiny of speaking up for the basic human right of fair treatment gets the employee fired. The silence is growing for fear of retaliation. And this is it's just not Walmart. It is all corporate business. I have another child who has was hired in a restaurant full time. After several weeks, she is now part time and is also a college student. I have been employed for eight years and still making less than $15. This is unacceptable. Tonight I am here to be a voice, a voice that will not go into the night without being heard, a voice for all the unfair pay and the unfair treatment to our people. When did we, the people, sell out to big, greedy corporations? Where is the unity? 
to say no to corporate greed, to corporate greed and say yes to the right of freedom, to live a suitable life. That is the American right that we have. Tonight, my brothers and my sisters, we have the vote to stand up against the Goliath of our time, which is Walmart and every corporate greed business. We will not be pushed out into the streets so they may go and gain billions and billions of dollars upon the hard work of us, the people. We must say no to a corporation that does not have the best interest of our town. We must say yes to our given right to work and live fairly, to live on respectable pay and treatment. Will you join me tonight? One voice to say no to poverty wages and unfair treatment. And for those of you in council, you all have taken an oath to uphold our Constitution. Our Constitution of the United States that was written by the people and for the people of the United States of America and not for the 1%. And just like our forefathers fought against tyranny, let's con continue to do so today. Lucha para nosotros. Fight for us, the people. Because at the end of the day, it is your duty. Thank you Thank very you. much. Lorraine Salas, followed by Alejandra Zamora. Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, everyone who has come here so far. Uh, to speak about the mistreatment that Walmart has been doing. It's not only Walmart, it's many more corporations out there. I'm also a resident of the Coachella Valley. I have been for 30 years. I am very proud to say that I grew up in the city of Coachella. And during that time, uh, growing up, I also marched with the United Farm Workers, with Cesar Chavez, and I continue that uh, I continue that not only is it a tradition, it's a value for me uh, growing up is to take, make sure that we take care of our workers because as you could see right now, uh, the effect of not taking care of our workers, we could see it, as I said two weeks ago, with our children, with our high school students. I'm sure some of us are familiar with that, uh, what is happening with some of our students out there. Anyway, so I, I so I, I also come here uh, to Desert Hot Springs. I also enjoy uh, the precious water that uh, Desert Hot Springs has here. And I also want to make sure that when I come into the city that when I do pay, uh, whatever I do pay, I want to make sure that the corporations are taking care of the workers. So. With that being said, we invited our organization, United for Respect, today, our Walmart, and they've been here. Some of them, well, they have been here for four years already, and we have been speaking out against the, the treatment, the mistreatment that Walmart is, is doing upon its workers. And as you saw tonight, uh, one of the workers uh, who was only six months away from her Social Security had gotten uh, had gotten fired, so so yes, I um, I just want to point out one last time. I know there's a lot of people in this city that really do want this Walmart here, and I understand for a lot of you that need the goods and services that Walmart provides. However, this is really a responsibility, a moral obligation amongst ourselves to make sure that Walmart is doing their job in making sure their workers are being treated fairly. If we know that this is not happening, we need to hold them accountable. And so the council tonight is responsible for that. I want to ask, what are you going to do to protect the families that are living here? What are you going to do? Thank you. Thank you. Alejandro Zamora, followed by Gerald Pope. 
Good evening. I'm here on behalf of, uh, in support of the Walmart, organi the Walmart organizers. I am a student at College of the Desert. It is my last semester, and I am very angry to see some of my uh, staff members, uh, my, my mentors, talk, up, talk to me about, hey, um, you need an education. And these are entry level positions that you're fighting for. Isn't that a little crazy? And I ask you this too. Yes, I agree that it is an entry level position, but how? How are we, the young people, supposed to support our education when everything that we need to succeed academically is so damn expensive? How can we do that? See, I work at the Tutoring and Academic Skills Center at College of the Desert, and I always encounter my classmates working very late and turning in their, uh, um, their homework late. Why? Because they work at some of these entry-level positions that are exploiting them. See, I'm not the only student, and I am privileged that I didn't have to work where some of these people are, are are turned to work because they don't have the assets or they haven't had the skills that are required to get another position. I am very fortunate and I ask every single fortunate person in this, in this setting to please consider the fact and consider some of these awarenesses and some of these issues that these people are experiencing. This isn't just somebody that just saw somebody else. We have people here that have suffered those issues, that have suffered those injustices. And I wanna ask the city here, because yes, I do spend my money here. As a constituent, I spend, as a taxpayer, I spend money here. I spend most of my time here because I have friends that live here, and I wanna ask you, what is your leadership position as far as protecting the community that is that will be working at Walmart? As a student, I don't see a future. I don't see a future for those entry level positions. If we're sending some families in those entry level positions or any student and we expect them to succeed, we're going downward. We're not growing and we are not necessarily standing for academic success at all. We are not going to make a change this way. We need to make a change and as trust, as, as the trusted positions that you guys have upheld, you guys need to consider these issues that are brought to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gerald Pope, you'll be next. Any, any future speakers, you don't have to pull the mic right to your phone. It does pick up your voice, and it's actually harder to hear you when you're on top of the mic because there's so many speakers here. It's, it's easier to pick up on the audio if you speak away from the mic a little bit. Thank you. Gerald Pope. I'm here to let you know that in the future, I will be a vocal advocate of the Desert Hot Springs Housing Authority because it is a valuable resource in the community with millions of dollars in capital assets and no debt. I want to remind you that you are the governing board of the Housing Authority and are responsible for making vital decisions. Now, the Housing Authority is poised to become a community development financial institution, becoming an intermediary of private and federal funding that for lending for community development work. We need an executive director a person to build an organizational structure and plan programming for community service. A person that thinks about the housing authority only and not for other departments. This person would be probably a young millennial eager to get experience. This person can be paid from the RDA program, which the RDA program ho owes the Housing Authority $3.5 million. And that $3.5 million has been approved by the state to be paid back. And now it's time for us to get that money back. They tell me that there has been a, uh, a citizens advisory committee that was organized last year. 
uh, they told me that there would be a meeting coming up on, on December 4th at the, uh, at, I'm not sure, I just heard about it, I'm gonna be there because anybody that wants to talk about housing, I'm gonna be there to be involved in it. So that's, uh, huh? January, that's what I said. You said December. I said, Jan <laughs> did I say January? You said December. <laughs> January the 4th, <laughs> the first Monday of January. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pope. Gabriella Jackson, followed by Gracilia Blancas. You can just, just talk regular, it'll pick you up. <laughs> My name is Gabrielle Jackson. Um, I live and teach in Palm Desert. I'm here because I'm feeling a little bit angry. And I'm angry because Walmart, which w is one of the richest, if not the richest corporation in the world, refuses to pay its workers a living wage. This proposed ordinance that Desert Hot Springs has for having the corporations pay a living wage is very important. This, it is not anti-Walmart, it is pro-family. That's what it is, it's for the family. It would enable parents to be able to provide for their families without the aid of public assistance. Which brings me to one reason why I'm so angry, which is that I am paying the benefits for the Walmart workers on my teacher salary because they need to get public assistance and able to, to be able to survive, and that's my tax dollars. And I think that Walmart, who is so rich, should be paying for them. I don't begrudge them their public assistance, but I just think that the corporation that can so afford to pay should. Also, I am angry because my students' parents work, I have parents who work at Walmart, and when they came to talk to me at conferences, I asked the parents, I said, I, you need to read to your child. And the dad looked at me and he said, I wor I'm working two jobs, I'm not there in the evening when my child goes to bed. And my wife is also working two jobs. So this child, the second grader, is being brought up by an older sibling because her parents together are working four jobs just to make enough money to keep that family together. And that's wrong. Now, I'm not completely unhopeful I am hopeful that you will bring this ordinance to pass and help to support the families of Desert Hot Springs. Thank you very much. Gracilia Blancos. I apologize if I didn't say your name correctly. Followed by Paul Miller. I'll, see, I'll be translating for her as well. Okay. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Graciela Blancas. Yo nada más quiero decir algo bien importante para mí. Um, en Walmart dicen muchas mentiras, uh, nunca cumplen lo que dicen, uh, lo que prometen más bien, y como a mí me, me despidieron por defender mis derechos, porque, porque uno sabe, yo quería mejoras en la tienda, quería muchas cosas para, buenas para la tienda, y no nada más para mí, sino para todos los trabajadores, y hubo muchas represalias en mi contra, y me despidieron. Hi, my name is Graciela, and I just want to say something that is very important to me. I want to say that I was fired from Walmart, and because I believed in 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 positive changes at the store, uh, also they uh, they they have come. They lied to me several times. They uh, tend to do that, um, and. Um, otra cosa muy importante, Walmart no, la corporación Walmart no, um, no, no sé cómo decir la palabra, pero ellos no saben en cuánto nos perjudican. Yo tengo una madre de 90 años, tengo dos niños en la escuela, uno en la prepa y uno en la universidad, no aquí, en México, pero todo eso perjudica a uno. Me perjudicó porque todavía no cumplía yo la edad para retirarme y me hicieron hasta pedir 
um, comida en una iglesia. Y para mí eso era vergonzoso, porque yo siempre he trabajado y nunca le pedí ayuda al gobierno, nunca. Y pienso, ¿qué va a hacer de los jóvenes que les pagan el sueldo mínimo y no tienen las 40 horas? Si yo que tuve las 40 horas por 11 años y trabajé antes en el fil, porque yo estuve con Chávez también, uh, yo pienso, ¿qué va a hacer de esos jóvenes? ¿Eso no piensan las corporaciones? La, 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 todo lo que pagan de comerciales, muy caro y todo, porque ese dinero no se los pagan a los trabajadores, porque no los ven sus necesidades. Eso es lo que yo siempre he pensado de todo, de todo de Walmart. No es una mala corporación. La, lo, 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 lo malo de la corporación es los dueños y, y como nos tratan ahora todos los manejadores. Ahora ya no es una, 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 una antes iba uno te, a trabajar bonito, con gusto. Ahora vas con miedo, porque todos los trabajadores tienen miedo de Walmart hasta de hablar para pedir al doctor. Nadie puede ir al doctor. Me pasó a mí. Because of the positive changes that I asked for, uh, they retaliated against me, they fired me. And also, I want to say that it has been very hard for me because I have children and I have a mother. Yes, they're not in here, they're in Mexico, but I still sustain them. Also, it has been very hard uh, because I, Walmart, told me to ask for food at food banks, which was very hard for me because I was very embarrassed to pursue this option. And this is what they're, they're forcing families to do. Another thing, now it is not... It's your three minutes, so it is not, feel it, free to come back at the next public comment period and gracias. speak again. Thank you very much. Paul Miller. Uh, good evening, my name is Paul Miller. Uh, I live in Desert Hot Springs. I didn't say anything last uh, uh, meeting because I wanted to uh, congratulate our new mayor personally uh, without any distractions. And so, uh, uh, Mayor Scott Mattis, congratulations on your uh, election. Uh, clear uh, voice of the people that they wanted new leadership and new direction. And also, uh, Anayeli uh, uh, Zavala, welcome. Uh, uh, she's been a delight already. You just meet her and she's got this smile going on. I go, oh, stop it. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, welcome back. Uh, I guess uh, not caught her, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, Yvonne, and uh, congratulations to you too, uh, Russ. And uh, Joe, well, I'd have to yell too loud to get to him. In any event, uh, uh, I, I wanted to, to um, uh, acknowledge that uh, that our city is on the brink of something good and and uh, life is going to be much better uh, regardless of uh, what else is being said. And, and then also uh, thank you uh, uh, Bruce Montgomery of uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, <laughs> of Grace Church of course. Uh, <coughs> ain't easy getting old, don't do it. <laughs> easy for you to say. In any event uh, yes, uh, as chairman of the uh, 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 Christian Ministerial Fellowship of Desert Hot Springs, we're not limiting this, and, and I hope that doesn't come across, that only Christians will be uh, uh, allowed to come through us. It's just that we're going to be the people that, uh, the group uh, through which this is going to happen. So don't get the idea that uh, if you're not a Christian, or if you're even an atheist, and you want to have a spiritual moment, uh, please approach us, uh, because uh, uh, that's the way it needs to be so that we don't upset anybody. And uh, yes, when a Christian speaks, then he should speak as a Christian. When a Muslim speaks, he should speak as a Muslim. When a Buddhist speaks, it's very silent. <laughs> and so I, I just think that, uh, and I'm, I don't mean that to make fun of, of Buddhism. Uh, but inspirational. It's, very, it's inspirational. That's kind of what I was saying. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. Uh, in any event, so I just wanted to make those comments, and uh, and uh, as you look at social media, uh, what a blessing to have our new chief, who is uh, very savvy. Uh, he, uh, not only does he know how to turn on a computer, but he also knows how to click the thing for like or respond to people's uh, concerns, because it's become a real um, second career for you, uh, chief, sir. And uh, I commend you for your... Uh, uh, yeah, shy, timid uh, as he is, um, and reserved. Let's see, I've got three seconds, two, one. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. God bless.
Due to time and multiple speakers left, uh, due, due to our policy, we're going to end with the speaker. The rest of the speakers will be moved to the end of the meeting. Saleh Kirby is our last speaker for this, this public comment period. Good evening, council members and staff. Um, basically, I'm just bringing a hat back, and it was at one of the first meetings, and it was given to me because one of the guys in um, the city thought it might have been mine. So I'm putting it on camera. <laughs> if this is yours, I'm going to leave it at the um, city um, city hall so you can pick it up. But you know, you need to come with a picture with you in the hat. <laughs> so I'm just leaving it at City Hall. We'll give it to our but, city um, clerk there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, since I have a few more minutes, um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but um, listening to the public speak about Walmart, I um, I do, I would like to say that um, at first I kind of thought Walmart would be a great idea. Um, as I'm thinking about it some more and listening to people and listening to what's going on, I think it just needs to be reconsidered and revamped. And I know that there's the concern or the um, there was a agenda item about the um, pay. If there is something that um, will enhance the quality of a worker that's working at Walmart, like a pay raise, I think that would be a good thing. Um, I don't know if you guys thought about maybe a neighborhood Walmart or even getting with developers that will bring in companies like um, Aldi's that pay their employees $13 an hour and gives them a raise every six months. I mean, we need to look at other options. Walmart is not the end all. You have Target, you have um, other grocery stores, and I'm sure we'll be glad to come in that doesn't have the reputation that Walmart might have. So that's, the, I'm just, you know, just something to think about, you know, because before you make that decision, and um, I mean, it's, it seems like it's very vocal, and I mean, from both sides of the room, it's very vocal, but, you know, there are options, there are other companies out there. So thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be moving on to the next item, which is city manager report. Mr. City Manager, you can give your report and refer to any of your staff that needs to make a report also, please. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. One thing, I just wanted to notify the council and, and the general public that uh, I've made a determination to close City Hall the last two weeks of December. I think it, it, it hits on two things. One thing is, as you know, with the salary cuts, uh, staff has you know, really taken a, a, a big hit. And as you recall, I brought, I recognized all the staff in front of the council that have been here six to 20 years. And um, uh, for those that have been here a really long time, even with the cuts and everything that we've been through, they're still here and they're still committed to this, this uh, community. And I think that's a very positive thing. Also, if you recall during when we had the discussions on the salary cuts, um, there was discussion about uh, having people reduce their vacation hours that were that were given that were accumulated over the years some were well above 300 400 hours and uh, the goal was to bring those uh, limits down to below 300 and I think we set it at 300 was the max so if you go below 300 you can accrue it again up to 300 and then that would that would max out so doing the furlough also helps uh, bring those hours down and it helps us save some money because we won't be accumulating a lot of these vacation hours to be paid out if uh, people ended up leaving. Um, so Thursday, six o'clock, City Hall is closed for two weeks until January 4th. Um, some of the management staff is still going to be here because uh, New Year's week because as you know, January 5th, uh, Tuesday, you have a council meeting and we have to get a packet out in New Year's week. So. Uh, while the doors may be closed, there may be some still some people here still working behind closed doors. And uh, on the last thing I want to do is, if you're wondering who the guy is sitting at the other end of the dais over there, um, probably people don't recognize him. You might. Um, this is Nathan Bove. He is our new community development director. He started today. Uh, Nathan comes with uh, a lot of experience in the public sector and even in the private sector. He was a consultant for some time, but he did some consulting, uh, planning consulting for the city of Selma, even the Agua Caliente Band of Mission Indians here, the Cuya Indians. Um, also uh, in Virginia, uh, he's done some planning. 
and uh, comes from Fresno. He was the planning manager in the city of Fresno. So uh, he comes and joins us today. Today's his first day. He's got a bachelor's in community development and a master's in public administration. And I would like you to join me in welcoming him to the city. Welcome, Nathan. He also, he also did some time here before, hasn't he? Yes, he was uh, actually a planner here before about 10 years ago. So, and he was also served on the Public Safety Commission several years ago, so. Thank you. Any other staff members have comments tonight? Chief? Well, you know I want to say something. Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> um, I, I just want to let the council know where we're at as far as infrastructure-wise. Uh, we are looking, OTS, the Office of Traffic Safety, has opened up their grant period, um, and we are in our initial phases of researching a grant specifically for pedestrian and bicycle safety um, throughout the city, um, but most specifically on Palm Drive. So I'll keep you posted as we apply for that grant. It is a competitive process, so there's no uh, guarantee that we'll receive funding, but we're gonna work on that. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we hosted uh, Citizens Academy that had about 20 some odd people that showed up. So thank you if you showed up for that and learned a little bit more about our um, our police department. We also, members of the department, participated in the parade. Um, and I walked the whole thing, actually thanks to the city manager, I had intended to walk several blocks. And then I stopped to shake hands and say hello to people and he kept right on going with that truck and trailer and I never did catch up with him. Um, <laughs> um, as far as hiring, we have one that has completed um, his last two steps in the process, we're waiting for results um, and we're hoping to actually get those results this week because he told me he, he will actually, um, like our new community development director, he will start tomorrow as, as soon as we get the results. So we're hoping, hoping to get him on board before the holidays, but if not, it'll be shortly after the first of the year. We have three in backgrounds and we are conducting interviews this week, um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and, and we're interviewing seven of, of those individuals. And then lastly, on January 6th, I don't think anybody here is in the audience, but um, I'm very honored. I actually got asked to give the keynote speech at the Women's Law Enforcement Leadership uh, Committee um, at the Inland Empire. Um, and I was really honored because I'm not a woman. So um, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to participating in that. Um, so if anybody's a member or would like to, uh, you don't get enough of me here, um, come on down to Colton and you can listen to me there as well. And does anybody have any questions? Oh, I, I would like to address one issue since Pastor Miller brought it up. There were actually a couple of things that were on Facebook um, today, one dealing with, with traffic, um, and, and we're actually looking in, into that on, and I'm gonna mispronounce this, Street Quinta? Quinta. Uh, Quinta. Quinta. Um, so we're looking at, into that, and then there was another thing that kind of blew up on Facebook today, and I will tell you that was not what it was perpetrated to be, and I'll just leave that at that. Thank you, Chief. Any other comments from staff? All right, we'll move on to mayor and council member comments. If you just put your name in the queue and how you want to speak, or if you want to speak. Okay, then I'll speak. Um, <laughs> my reports are, uh, as of Wednesday, December 2nd, uh, the Rancho Del Oro community has been working for 20 odd years to get their landscaping taken care of. So we were set in a subcommittee about a year ago. We had made some progress. Uh, we had then stalled because of uh, unforeseen reasons and we're back on track. So the Rancho Del Oro committee has met uh, there will be another subcommittee of Rancho de Oro at the beginning of January. It will go to a public meeting of the Rancho de Oro folks. And then if they agree to whatever they want to agree to, then it will go to the city council for a study session and then an administrative item for a vote. I'm hoping to have this process done in the next 90 days if we can stay on track. On Monday, December 7th, the CVAG Executive Committee met. Um, this is the Coachella Valley Association of the Governments and all the mayors or appointees from each city uh, meet to talk about the issues facing the region here in the Coachella Valley and Blythe. 
Uh, they gave a presentation on the Jefferson interchange, as I know that there's around 8,000 people leave our community every day to work, that there are people that work in Indio. Stay uh, for the next year or so. Be very cautious when you travel in that area because the interchange is gonna change many times in that year period, but they're on track. It was very interesting to see that they are pouring 10 feet of cement on the overpass. That's how thick it'll be. So it's amazing to see the progress that they're making and how they're doing it. Concrete. Concrete, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, you're absolutely right. I've been corrected by friends that are in construction many times on that, and I still don't get it right. Um, approval of the, uh, the grade separation project at Avenue 66 in Coachella, as they have many grade separation projects going on. This one's been moving forward. And then there was a motion by Mayor Peabody, who is the former mayor of Indian Wells. Uh, they have a rotating mayor, and each year they change, and I believe that Mayor Dana Reed has taken over now. But uh, he made a motion that the CV link be taken back to each city and voted on by the people. The problem with that, <laughs> thank you for your applause on that, but the problem with that is that CVAG doesn't supersede the processes that each council has. So there was a motion to be made that each council go back and entertain the ideas, let alone the cost that would come of it for each city. So for a regional board to mandate how uh, each city council work, it didn't go over well within the city councils. But they did support the idea of going back and having more study sessions and talking to the people about it. My dilemma, as I mentioned in that meeting, was that Desert Hot Springs is technically not part of the CV Link as of yet. We have supported the idea of the CV Link and supported the idea of the environmental review, but we have to go out and find grant funding to actually build a spur that will connect to the CV Link. As of now, it only connects from Palm Springs to the Salton Sea, bypassing Desert Hot Springs. So I'll be bringing that as a study session in the near future to talk about and uh, find uh, our position. Uh, as We've taken a position of support, find our position on where the spur will, will eventually go. On Wednesday, December 9th, we finalized the China trip. Now, I've got to make some comments on this. There was a request from a local spa whose uh, manager has relatives in China, a very large city, out right, right outside the city, which is a small village, and Russ could probably talk more about the names of the villages than I can. We after I was elected, it was not my choice. When this first request came through, it was two months ago, um, the, the individuals requested again after the election that we, we set a contingent delegate to go to China for economic development partnerships and possibly sister city partnerships. I and the city manager did not feel that we could get away in this holiday season and asked if we could move it to the, after the beginning of the year and they insisted that we do not because of possibly missing out on opportunities. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, uh, Joe McKee, who just came back from a uh, overseas vacation, had his passport in hand, ready to go. So we started going down the line and after going through about 10 different people, we found three individuals that had uh, passports that were ready to go. Um, and so Mr. McKee went, our planning commissioner, J Derek, Dirk Voss, who's also the president of the Chamber of Commerce, and we found one employee that had a passport, Danny Porras, who's our public works manager, and they are representing the city of Desert Hot Springs. They landed yesterday after 16 hours. They've sent many photos, which is very nice. If you're following Dirk Voss on Facebook, you'll see those. And they are, they are going to report back in a study session at the beginning of the year on how that went. So we're very excited about the possibilities that could come of this. They have um, mirroring um, sort of a city there where they have spas and, and, and recreation, and so they're trying to build sister city develop par uh, partnerships, so I like it. On Wednesday, December 9th, uh, I attended the Riverside County Transportation Commission. I was voted in as chair of uh, 30, out of 34 members. I worked up through the ranks, and I am now chair of that commission. Um, we reprogrammed some dollars for the 91 freeway project. If you've driven on the 91, you know that there's a lot of construction going on, a lot. It is working towards the end in the next couple years, but there's some money that had to be reprogrammed that wasn't spent correctly, so we did that. And then the election of officers took place. I took the chair, and Dana Reed from Indian Wells took second vice chair, as Supervisor John Tavaloni was now vice chair. So we have two representatives from the Coachella Valley on the executive committee. On December 10th, I attended the I attended CVB, which is a Coachella Valley uh, Visitors Bureau for the Greater Palm Springs area. I will be appointed. I appointed myself as the appointee to that organization. They gave me an orientation of where they stand and how visitors serving, how they participate in our visitors serving uh, here in Desert Hot Springs. 
On December 10th, I also a, I had an Erica meeting, which is our emergency radio system. And I had made a suggestion two meetings ago that we look at refinancing our debt for possibilities of saving money. They looked into that and that is a possibility and we will be saving money. We have another, Chief help me out, was it another three years on debt? I think it's another three years in debt. Um, and so they're looking at refinancing that out of the five sisters, uh, five sisters, five cities that are participating. Um, two cities have paid off their infrastructure backbone uh, components. Two, three of us cities have not, and we're gonna refinance that debt and hopefully save some money. Um, and then we were given an update on how the program works as we have new members coming on board. On Tuesday, December 10th also, I was asked to meet with Origin Company. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is I meet with a lot of people, but there's a lot of questions about this. When you're coming in on Pearson Boulevard off Highway 62, you see these new windmills out there. A lot of people have had questions about those. They were prototype back east. They brought them out here. They're actually uh, only 150 feet tall rather than 300 feet. Uh, this company is taking out all the old windmills in that windmill farm from the 1980s and replacing them with new windmills and new technology. This technology, according to them, will produce uh, more power, as much power as the bigger ones, just at a faster rate. For, um, so it's, it's opportunities. They wanted to let all the surrounding cities know that they're, they're building out there. I believe it's a total of around 30 windmills. They'll build over a uh, three-phase project, which is uh, in, in within a year. It's a new technology, it's supposed to be a safer technology and it's supposed to be a more energy, um, produce more energy, so. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be invited to North Palm Springs. If you come on Indian Avenue at the corner of 20th Avenue there, there's a business park on the east side of the street. Uh, if you know that all the east side of the street is part of the annexation that the city of Desert Hot Springs went through four or five years ago. That business park has um, business owners in there. And one of the business owners is a business called uh, JDEC. It's a technology that's been around for about uh, 30 years. It's an insulation technology for um, board uh, building. And it's a really neat technology and it's, 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 it's a newer technology that a lot of builders aren't using it yet but they're looking towards uh, saving builders money in the future because it takes three processes and move it into one. It's a long process. I'm sure they give you a tour if you ever want to come out. The reason I'm talking about it is that they, they've hired six or seven people that are helping with this technology. Well, they've come up with a new technology and they're not unveiling it for another couple of weeks till the patent is finished, but they gave us a tour of the space that they'll be utilizing and the machines they'll be utilizing and what that technology is. They're gonna open up with and, and produce 20 more jobs. They're exporting all this material into Mexico and China at this point and uh, Pakistan. They eventually want to utilize this, this type of uh, technology for the United States, but it's something different to builders and builders don't always you know, like to change. But it's costing about a half of the price it would to build a home, if not less. So it, the great thing about it is that they're going to uh, give 20 new jobs to individuals and then they hope to expand even further and produce more jobs in the future. But it's a locally run business here in Desert Hot Springs, so it was nice. I attended the Planning Commission, the Public Safety Commission, uh, just to state that we want to make sure the chairs have a process for getting the recommendations through. I wasn't able to attend the CCAC because of a mixture that night, but I'll be coming to the next CCA meeting and meeting with the chair of that meeting, or that, that commission. Um, Mr. Pope, I, I hear you, Housing Authority, we'll get on the subcommittee for you. And then if you don't follow me on Facebook or my website, uh, please uh, send me your information via email through the city staff, however you'd like to get it. If you want to participate in committees, there'll be multiple committees that'll be coming out that I want the people to be involved in in our community. Um, and then I wanted to say thank you to Donna Poyazina and your huge committee of individuals, Jackie Chapman and Oh, there was a couple other people I think I helped you, but for such a small group, they put on a parade. It um, went very excellent. <laughs> my, my caps were sore the next day and I got hit with uh, uh, snowballs, thank you Russ, um, <laughs> at the beach party, uh, but it was, a, it was a fun event for the community to be out in. And Walgreens came out through Rotary and gave flu shots. I think they gave close to 60. Was it somewhere in there? Um, so it, it was a wonderful event, and Donna said, I know what I did wrong this year, and I'm gonna do it better next year. And I said, wow, you, I thought it was done well enough. So I can't imagine what we're gonna have next year. We're gonna have planes or something. Who knows what's gonna be in it. Um, Mr. Patrick, are you gonna speak on the SCAG, uh, the 
RTP. You want me to do it? Okay. Um, Southern California uh, Southern California Association of Governments, uh, the Regional Transportation Plan and Sustainability a Sustainable Community Strategic strategy. Whew. That's a plan that's been put out. There's a comment period. Uh, staff is looking into it. We have two members that sit on that uh, regional committee, which is uh, Council Member Betts and Mayor Pro Tem Joe McKee. I'm sure they'll be helping the, with the comment period, but this is an important per uh, period to, to look at this on the website and make your comments if you like. This is going to set some precedents for, I think, up to 2040. So Mr. Betts might have some more comments on that. Um, you can go to their website, again, SCAG, uh, S-C-A-G, and then R-T-P-S-C-S if you'd like to make comments. Um, this is a collective vision for the region's future and is developed with input from local governments, county transportation commissions, tribe, tribal governments, nonprofit organizations, businesses, and local stakeholders within the counties of Imperial, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Ventura. So with that said, I don't have any other comments. I'll move on to Mr. Betts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, I want to um, thank you for your hard work to get a contingent going to China. I bowed out uh, for um, personal family reasons, and uh, you did a good job rounding everybody up to get them um, there. I, uh, we did manage, just so everybody knows, we did manage to get a uh, brochure um, in Chinese and English prepared. So we sent them with something good in hand, and and I know they worked uh, really hard with the staff to um, get the uh, the uh, materials they needed to put it on a, a good uh, presentation for the city. Um, just in case you're wondering, cost on this was I think about $115. So um, we sent them with enough to. Uh, so so we're putting a good good face on the uh, presentation there, along with some good people that are going there. Um, Chief, on um, Quinta Way, the speeding and the other different places where we've had these uh, complaints, what can we do? Is there, is there, we've got the grant coming, but is there anything short uh, sooner than that that we could do? Is COP in a position that they could provide some presence or something we they, could do? They are. That's going to be, that will be part of it. We'll have the COP patrol there. We'll have our officers patrol there when they're have some proactive patrol time. Um, and I think you had inquired about the potential or possibility of some traffic calming devices. So when Danny comes back from China, uh, I'm gonna get with him and ask him about that as well. Okay, because I mean, this is all over the city. We got uh, what, uh, Two Bunch Palms Trail has been a speeding zone. Choya, when they come out of the high school and go down uh, you know, there, uh, Sonora on the way to the schools. Uh, like get a hold of some people that are driving 50 miles an hour through a residential street with children nearby. Um, so anyhow, if we could do and, something. And, and if I may, also because of a of a comment that was made, and and you're right, we do have those. That's not just the only area, but one of the comments that was made was it wasn't safe for my kids to play in the street. Um, you you are 100 percent correct. <laughs> you you know don't let your children play in the street, and their likelihood of getting struck is going to be greatly reduced, so. And the elderly. I think the caveat on that is if you live in a residential street, it's pretty common that kids are out in a street where there's, people are supposed to be going less than 50 miles it, an hour. It, and it is, and that street, if nobody's aware of it, I drove up and down it today, it is a very wide street. Yeah. So, frankly, if I was a kid, I'd probably be playing in the street as well on my bike and scooter and things because it is a very wide street and plenty of room. So anyhow, just uh, yeah, if we could get something going on that. I just keep getting so many emails from people and Facebook seems to explode with that all the time. Um, I don't know if anybody's here from CERT, but I had a request come in today. There's people who are uh, disabled and worried about uh, El Nino and you know they know sandbags are available, but they don't have any way to get them. So they're wondering what happens if they have to get something to protect their homes. Do we have something where um, our community is, is addressing that need out there? So I'll just throw that out there. And if anybody's here from CERT listening or can work on that and address that, or if our city public works has an answer, or our city manager, if somebody calls, we can't just tell them, hi, I need a sandbag. Or they can't just say, I need sandbags. They need somebody to actually bring them there and set them up. So um, this came up in. Um, Inland Empire of the discussion there. 
Um, Christmas parade was wonderful. Donna, thanks for your hard work on that. Um, there was a, I don't know if you've seen it, there was a video taken from up on top of the building looking down on these kids having the snowball fight. And when I, when I got there, um, the, um, you know, and the parade, I was going to watch the whole rest of the parade, but I watched these kids just, just explodes into this uh, um, thing. And, and I, I want to give a special shout out. I had, for some reason, over this Walmart issue, I don't know why, but I had must have gotten 150 calls over Thanksgiving. I mean, people were even calling while I was eating thanks for uh, giving dinner. I want to thank Chris Lucker for that. And uh, so, but uh, now Chris is pretty shy. I like to sit out there and didn't want to get much attention. But I called up Chris to say thanks for all the phone calls. And I said, also, by the way, would you mind? Uh, buying some snow for the community. And so Chris stepped up, and that was no small gesture. So thank you, Chris. We, we appreciate you coming forward with that contribution and, and getting some snow for the kids. That was very nice. And thanks for all the phone calls, by the way. <laughs> Maybe we can return the favor. Um, we'll see. Uh, let's see what else we got here. City Manager, Airbnb audit, something we brought up a while back. We know they're out there. We know we can track it. We know generally we're looking at $75,000 to $100,000, but I haven't seen any progress on that in six, eight months. Are we so flush with cash that we can't pursue that, or where are we at on this one? Well, you mean a vacation rental audit, so we not just Airbnb. I got that. I know, but all the vacation rental. Vacation sites. rental. But you could go to just Airbnb right now, and I know that you're working on well, I know putting that some project together. Yeah, but there was also we could go through, pick out every property in Desert Hot Springs that is doing these rentals, right. and easily track. And I went through, just spent half hour on it or an hour on it, and and quickly came up with. You know, an estimate of fifty to one hundred thousand dollars, depending on how aggressive you get with this. Right. And I just hadn't heard anything back from staff, so I'm asking now: Are we going to do anything about that, or should I just let the idea so drop some, and say we don't need the fifty thousand? Is something that you want staff to do? Well, we've there's, already there's somebody, talked about this. Because right. there is somebody that I've worked with in other cities, and she does it by contract, and she's, you know, she <clears throat> does exactly what you suggest, and she's tracked down hundreds of thousands of dollars for cities. Um, I don't know how she does it. I assume she's doing it like you suggest. Can I make so a like, suggestion? Are you asking I, whether staff I, I, I can just want to know that I offered yeah. to, to find somebody from staff, and you can only put it out there so many times, and you put it out there quietly, and then at some point in time you say, you know what, I'm getting tired of asking. So are we going to do anything about it? Can I make a suggestion that we bring it? Uh, can we bring it as a study session so the new council members can understand it better? Because I know the last council is the one that voted on the procedures and then we can possibly get movement on this for Mr. Betts? Well, we're talking about two different subjects. One is what he was working on, and I agree with you. If you want to bring that back to get the rest of the council up to speed, that's fine. I'm talking about our city staff going through, generating invoices, mailing them off to people, and letting them know they owe us some money because there's been some, some rental properties out there, uh, casitas rented out on a regular basis. I think your point's been made. It looks like they're formulating a plan to get back to you at the next I'm meeting. Was, I was waiting for an answer is what I was waiting for. Well, you report to my office at 7 a.m. I will sit you in a cubicle with a staff member to do that. At 7 a.m.? What day? Wow. I'll be there. Thank you. Wonderful. Someone get that on video, please. <laughs> is that all you got? No. I'm oh, you got more? Go I'm ahead. Almost, it's not that much. Um, the um, at some point, you know, Walmart for some reason has been in the news and discussion, a lot of public comments, and at some point in time, we got to figure out, well, are they even coming and when? And um, I, I don't know when staff could prepare something for the council, but my discussions have been that. Back in 2010, they submitted something, and we put out some type of public notice, and then there was a workshop, and everybody attended with the expectation something was going to happen. And then, um, was it 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, five years has gone by, and the question is when? Um, we, we, was it eight months ago, we authorized the hiring of a consultant to review the EIR. We put a reimbursement agreement in front of 
um, Walmart to sign because they're paying for that. And that hasn't been done. And there's six months worth of work. Um, we've got to get to the point, and just so everybody understands, the council can't, this city can't do anything to hold up this project if it comes forward. When they, you know, once they say, boom, start in line, let's go, let's get this going, the clock starts ticking and we've got to follow a process of public hearings. The city doesn't have the ability to hold something up forever just because it wants it or doesn't want it or whatever. So I'm just waiting for the, somebody to tell me when is this going to move forward? When are we actually going to have something here? Because it's been five, six years, you know, gone through two elections now with huge amounts of contributions coming through and I'm just wondering if this is more of a campaign issue and we're not ever going to see anything or if there's actually really a proposal out there because it's not right for this community to get all worked up one way or the other and not to know if somebody's coming or not. So it's time for them to come here and make a presentation to the city and let us know what they are or are not going to do. Um, Nathan, welcome. It's good to have you. I uh, know you did good work for the city in the past, and uh, Mr. City Manager, you've done a real good job selecting uh, Nathan Bouvet to fill that position. So that was great. And um, to everybody else, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, and um, away we go. Thank you. I have one comment to make before I get to the two council members. Uh, Jeff, can you raise your hand back there? He is the first chair of one of my committees that I've appointed the Veterans Committee. Uh, he'll be working with the last chairman and a couple other individuals that have been helping out the Vets Park. Uh, but I just wanted to raise your hand so if you're a vet and interested in the committee, he's going to want assistance. They'll be meeting uh, in January and we'll announce at the next meeting. Council Member Parks. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not going to talk very long. I just want to compliment again Donna on the parade. I had a ball. I didn't walk it, but I got a uh, thank goodness for Jan Pye and her convertible. And um, Larry Buchanan and I got to sit up in the back of her convertible and ride in the parade, and we had a good time. And um, it was great. I love the snow. The kids had a ball. Enough of that. Um, I have been appointed to a CBAG committee. However, they're all dark for the month of December. The only one that met was the executive committee, and so all the rest of them are dark. But tomorrow morning, do I go to the airport commission or not, Gerald? I haven't heard back yet. Oh, so do you, what do you think? Should I show up? I think your first meeting would probably be in January. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I no. should. January. Oh, January. January. Okay, so I won't go tomorrow morning. All right, that means I can sleep in till 7. <laughs> you could show up at 7 with me at City Hall. <laughs> what, what, what did he say? You can show up with him at 7 30 at City Hall. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't make 7 o'clock meetings. I'm good for 10. Um, Nathan, welcome. I remember working with you before, and it was you were good then, and I know you're going to be great now. And um, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, because we won't be seeing you again until the 5th of January. So have a happy holiday. Great, great vacation if you're taking one and get lots of presents and all that good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Councilwoman Zavala. I just wanted to reiterate everyone's comments and once again thank uh, Donna and everyone who participated in the planning process for the parade and the beach party, which were amazing. And uh, I did walk it along with um, the mayor and uh, Councilman McKee. So we all walked and it was great. It's a good way to get active in the community and to provide a fun space for kids and for families. So aside from that, uh, an update for me would be uh, just mentioning that in January, I will be attending an orientation with the California League of Cities for newly elected officials, and I'll, ha I'll have a report for you then. And then um, I will resume all the appointment committee meetings in January as well, given the holidays and their scheduling conflicts. So thank you, and happy holidays, and see you again in January.
Thank you. With that, I'll close mayor and council member comments. Uh, I ask that we move up administrative item number five first. So we'll move that up. That's a professional service agreement with the Lou Edwards Group for communications and ballot measures. Consulting services is City of Desert Hot Springs. Administrative Service Services Director Joseph Tanner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I just have a, a real quick uh, couple of slides to get through just to kind of let the council and the community know what uh, what we're talking about and, and what's at stake uh, moving forward. Uh, and then uh, uh, Ms. Catherine Liu will also have a presentation and we'll go through the, the process involved in, in getting a, uh, a, or moving a ballot measure forward for 2016. So what is, what is happening? Uh, <clears throat> on June 30th, 2020, uh, the city of Desert Hot Springs has two revenue measures, tax measures expiring. It's known as the P-Tax 1 and the Utility Users Tax. Both of those uh, equal $4.8 million to the city. And to put that in a little bit of perspective, that's 17% of the city's total budget, including capital projects, successor agency, uh, debt service, everything all wrapped into one. Uh, it's 35% of the general fund budget and 46% of the public safety fund, which covers police, fire, uh, and graffiti abatement. And why now? Well, we think two, 2016 will be a very favorable year for a ballot measure with the presidential election. And then also there is a lot of uncertainty uh, moving forward without having a revenue measure in, uh, in place. Uh, and then we also have only so many chances left before those uh, tax measures expire. So the breakdown of the P-Tax and utility users tax is as follows. I also included the P-Tax 2, which we are also collecting on. That uh, item is not expiring in 2020, but I thought just for the, the benefit uh, of information, I included it uh, in the breakdown. So, so far uh, for 14-15, fiscal year 14-15, the city collected 1.9 million in P-Tax 1 and with the utility users tax is actually split in two different funds with 1.8 million going towards the public safety budget and another million dollars is paying for debt service, which is not uh, a general fund obligation. However, when the UTUT expires, uh, the, the bondholders are still gonna expect their money and that money's gotta come from somewhere. And unless there is something to, to replace it, it's gonna come out of the, of the general fund. Uh, this is something I'm gonna talk about later, but these are our cash, our cash projections for, the next, uh, for this fiscal year and the next two fiscal years, uh, ending with uh, just over $5 million per year in cash. And so if we just take what we've done so far with the cash projections and we just kind of do a, a real rough estimate of where we think we might uh, be, uh, we go from $5 million to $380,000 balance in the general fund uh, rather, rather quickly and at a very uh, alarming, alarming rate in my opinion. And also to, uh, to let the public and, and council just kind of review we went, the, the city went from uh, a general fund budget of a high of 18.3 million to 14.7, and now uh, this fiscal year we have a $14.3 million uh, general fund budget. Uh, I was uh, not around for all those cuts, uh, but I have watched some of the meetings and I've talked to staff and, and other folks in the community and going from a $18 million uh, budget to a $14 million project uh, budget is a pretty painful uh, process and it's something that uh, I would like to avoid and I'm sure that the other staff would like to avoid as well because if you lose 14.8 million or roughly uh, almost 5 million, you're looking at a budget of, uh, you know, just over nine and a half million and you know, we're, we're under a lot of guidelines by uh, the state law and what we're allowed to have, and we're talking that's the basic minimum service. Uh, we're already service insolvent right now as it is, and to cut an additional 
4.8 million dollars or what we have now is going to be pretty pretty rough to say the least uh, and so i would like to uh, turn it over to Catherine lou who is with the lou edwards group she also has a presentation on the on the process and what's involved and then also just as a uh, a side note that uh, the staff report list uh, 144,600 uh, through some kind of uh, negotiations of the contract. We're actually asking for an additional uh, 5,000 and it's not laid out in the staff report of how it's the extra 5,000 is gonna be paid for. However, uh, we do have a, another uh, contract that was recently canceled because we found another source. We've talked about it, uh, MetroScan before and that contract alone is is five thousand so we do have the funds to to cover to cover the contract through through budget savings and i'd be happy to turn over to miss catherine good evening mayor and council members city staff members of the community it is so wonderful to be in your house with friends both old and new as a matter of fact it was our privilege to be of assistance to the city on the utility users tax and parcel tax measures described by Mr. Tanner. We are here to present ourselves anew to uh, those that may have not had the opportunity to work with us. And we will do so and describe the process by which we might engage and partner with you again um, by describing the best practices that you have engaged in in the past to enact these successful measures. So first, uh, for those who have not met us before, just a little bit about ourselves. Uh, the Lou Edwards Group, working with uh, Fairbank, Madeline, Mall, and Metz and Associates, FM3 Research, uh, represent public agencies up and down the state of California, um, several hundred to date. It has been our privilege to enact 79 billion with a 95% enactment rate. We previously represented the city on Measure A in 2009 and Measure G in 2010. And um, both of our organizations offer two different and synergistic scopes of service uh, to your city and others. As a lead consultant, our organization develops the engagement and community conversations piece to fully involve your constituencies in the planning and preparation for your next steps and vision. We are very grateful for our nationally recognized award-winning communications practice. And though we have the opportunity to partner with any opinion research firm of our choosing, um, the city has been well served in the past by FM3 Research. John, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Good evening. Uh, it's nice to be here again. Uh, John Fairbank. Uh, my firm specializes in public opinion research. We've been doing public opinion research for the last 25, 30 years. We actually do the polling for the California League of Cities and hundreds of cities throughout the the state. <clears throat> we also work with uh, pr primarily on finance measures. Um, schools, community colleges, but primarily cities and have had the good fortune of uh, being very successful. 95% of our, our uh, polls have been accurate as to measures being passed for cities that we recommend going forward. And again, we had the pleasure of working with you on both your previous measures and look forward to helping you again. Thank you, John. In consideration of your packed agenda, we will go through quickly some of our uh, slides and, and uh, key takeaways that we'd like the council and community to have this evening. The first is the importance Very good. We have found in the past that it's necessary to um, fully engage over protracted uh, process. And both of the measures that uh, uh, the utility user tax and parcel tax measures did feature several months of preparation. I have a saying that will resonate with many people in the room. The taxpayer does not wish to be big-footed in today's environment. 
every taxpayer and every member of the community wants to feel as though they are part of the solution. That does lend itself to a longer runway of community conversation and engagement to ensure that any proposal that you present reflects community perspectives. The first step in that process it will be to implement an updated baseline opinion research study and then to engage your stakeholders and community partners in the conversation. We are advising other city councils, not just yours, that in a very busy, competitive election environment with many top of mind issues for today's constituents, a united house, not a divided one, will be critical to the viability of any future measure. Again, just to review the action steps for the public and the council. The first step is really to conduct an updated baseline survey and because of the body of the work that our team has performed in the past on your behalf, it, it will be possible for John and his team to track constituent attitudes to see how they have shifted or remain consistent over time. The second step is to implement a public engagement program where we solicit input, answer questions, including tough questions, and, and really um, engage the community so that their views are reflected and their priorities are reflected in any proposal that you put forward. As we have in the past, we would recommend, for example, if you're looking at a possible November measure, that the first survey be done as soon as possible and a second survey be conducted um, in July, shortly before placement of the measure on the ballot. John, would you like to talk a little bit more about the use of survey research? Better. We pull uh, voter registration, uh, our samples from the voter registration file. So we're looking at voters who have histories of voting in November 2016, and then we'll conduct it both uh, on, uh, by online and by telephone. We purchase additional cell phone numbers, landline numbers, uh, emails, so that we can uh, update the, the communication and the the uh, connections on getting responses from your voters. So the, the goals of the survey, we're trying to reassess attitudes and as, as Catherine suggested, track kind of from what we've, over the last, I think we've done three polls for you back in, starting in 2008. Determine which services are the highest priorities, gauge initial vote preferences if you're looking at multiple types of measures for funding or different amounts for different uh, measures or the the um, continuation of your past measures, we will test those. We, we have ballot language that uh, we test that was prior to the measures and then any new ballot language or measures that you want to you want to look at as alternatives. We test the structures of the measures, we test the individual components, um, and we go do basically a, a kind of the testing some arguments for, arguments against, and asking voters to watch their movement throughout to simulate uh, how they might hear different information. Thank you, John. Following the conducting and updating of the community research, we would um, partner with the city on different engagement components, which typically include interactive direct mail. And a lot of cities ask me, well, in today's 24-7 social media environment, is direct mail even relevant? Well, we do find that it is necessary to engage the public a multiple number of ways, whether it be through information in local uh, media outlets, through social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, direct mail being only one uh, component of that information. We would also recommend, as the city has done in the past, going out to community organizations and pe in places where your constituents gather, again, to get input and to respond to questions. And including um, factual information on your budget and service challenges in all city communications vehicles, such as your website and other avenues. We will now just very quickly touch on some of the best practices that we implemented on the city's behalf in measures A and G. And again, measure A 
for those that may not remember, was placed on the May 2009 ballot. That was a low turnout special state election. As Mr. Tanner indicated, it was a 2% UET increase requiring a two-thirds threshold for passage. We initiated efforts 10 months in advance. John conducted two surveys. We implemented six informational mailings approved by the city attorney. So over that 10 month period, there is robust engagement and information and conversation going back and forth between the city and its constituents. That measure was adopted with 74.81% yes. And we'd like to share just a couple of slides just so the uh, community and the council can refresh their memories on how you do your research. These are, our, the surveys are, are rather comprehensive. These are 18 to 20 minute surveys and we try to address all issues before you on, on a particular measure. This question basically was, are you more or less likely to support a measure if it had uh, certain accountability items requiring all expenditures be on independent audits? We're looking for language to be inserted in the 75 words that you would propose if you go forward with a measure like this. This next question is, uh, we test a number of issues. What, what are the serious issues facing your city? Extremely very, somewhat serious. Uh, historic over the last three or four years, um, crime, public safety has been at the top of the issues. We test uh, multiple issues. This is just one page. You can see the number of parolees, drugs. This is very high numbers of concern. Not unlike many cities, but your your, your voters are, are very particularly uh, focused on the, the crime, public safety issues. We also ask, uh, kind of, uh, as I said earlier, simulating, giving them additional information about a measure. This was a question that, that tested some po a couple positive statements. Would you be more or less likely to support uh, the measure if you heard the following? And we try to give some factual uh, information about um, how the money would be used, who would support it, why it's needed, and ask uh, voters to, once they hear that information, how then would you support the measure? We ask, uh, th we ask three or four times the same me measure. In, in your baseline survey for this measure, we, you started out with about 69% support it went up to about 83% after positive kinds of messages and then it went back down to 78%. So you can see the range you ended up with around 74%. So we're within plus or minus. Uh, these, are, these are pretty accurate because voters know what they're looking at, the 75 words. They know what the money they're asking them for. They know where it's going. So we're trying to make it as clear and relevant and uh, straightforward as possible. And they're pretty accurate on uh, predicting what, uh, how the, what the outcome is. Thank you, John. Very quickly, uh, in companion with the survey research, as I mentioned, we did engage the community robustly over six mailings, three of which were done prior to the council's placement of a measure on the ballot to get the input. As you notice, on this particular mailing, it's interactive. So it was a trifold card from our police chief at the time, and it solicited feedback on how people uh, wanted to see their service priorities. Other examples not shown on the slide, we then reported back what the feedback was and kept folks informed of our deliberations. Now this card is an example. This, I believe, was the last card in the series of six. And as you can see, we did reprint the ballot question, yes, no. And there's information about uh, Measure A as a unique local issue. The city did issue this information. As you notice, it does include the citation of the measure letter. This was some years ago, so some of the legal standards have changed as to the format of these types of mailings, so we would be collaborating with your city attorney on any future communications. Now, um, we will quickly touch on our protocols in Measure G. 
That was a public safety sales tax extension. We basically went from May 2009 right back on to the June 2010 ballot. So we had a spread of several months to prepare, but it was, it was a sequenced, if you will, revenue generation plan. So Measure G was placed in the June 2010 ballot to extend the existing single family residential $121 parcel, smaller amount for apartment and mobile homes. Planning efforts were undertaken immediately following the successful passage of Measure A. As two surveys were recently conducted for A, one tracking survey was conducted for G as a cost effective measure. We, our team was able to build on the messaging and success of A and implemented just three follow-up mailings also approved by the city attorney. Again, we robustly engaged the community and that measure was adopted with 82.57% yes. And as John will now describe, he did track additional perspectives and information in his follow-up survey. So again, just quickly, this is a question that we're just trying to get a, a gauge of uh, optimism in cities. This is a question, is your city going in the right direction or is it off on the wrong track? And you can see uh, the, the differences here over two or three years. The most recent survey was up at 70% right track, 18% wrong track. So we're just trying to, to gauge a number of different perceptions of mood of your voters. Uh, this again is the serious problems we're tracking uh, from the from the earlier survey you can see the similar results on most of the drugs including meth seriousness of these issues this is we're just trying to again understand the 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 sentiments of voters as they're getting ready to support another measure um, it's kind of accurate, inaccurate question. We're looking for more specific kinds of awareness of, of your voters with your city. Uh, making Desert Hot Springs a safer city will strengthen our local property values. This is one of the reasons that many of these measures are, are passing. It's a direct uh, relationship to improving not only the business climate, the property values, um, and these kinds of measures. Uh, same kind of question, important, what are, what's important in, in, in trying to figure out how to, to craft the 75 words we're looking for, what is important to your voters among the veter many expenditures that uh, you use this money for. You can see huge percentages uh, on all of the measures, all the, the specific elements and programs that you would spend your money on. Um, this is kind of, again, just an initial vote. You started out with about 58% on your 75 words after the positive statements you went up to 76 and uh, you can see again the this similar percentages 74 76 67 all in the range of what you ended up voting for and your voters must be commended because supporting two measures back to back at two-thirds most cities never in their lifetime support uh, measures at two-thirds and to have two back to back like this is an extraordinary level of confidence, but also support for the programs that you presented to your voters. Thank you, John. And again, uh, we did uh, disseminate factual information associated with Measure G, as shown on these slides. What do these best practices mean moving forward? So some of the key considerations, obviously our team, based on our institutional knowledge and the fact when Desert Hot Springs calls, we respond. We'll work with Urban Futures Inc. and city staff to determine the optimal revenue options that should be vetted at this time. As in the past, it will be possible for the city to achieve cost efficiencies if property and our voter measures are planned within a foreseeable sequenced timetable. As I mentioned pre previously, taxpayers don't want to be big-footed. They do want to be part of the solution, which does require some runway of time to have those conversations. Our team will work closely with your city attorney to utilize practices that engage and inform your public within your current communications vehicles. I might also add that there's been a change in law since our last partnership, AB 809 was adopted, which does change the format of the ballot question that you present to the public, making it 
slightly more cumbersome and more technical in nature, but something to be aware of moving forward. Finally, um, I will indicate that city issued information obviously cannot advocate any partisan position and is evaluated within the context of its style, tenor, and timing. But your city, as it has in the past, has an absolute right to informational speech within these non-advocacy parameters. This timeline shows, and we have advised this of all of the agencies that we're representing in 2016. The bottom line is, if you decide to partner with our firm, we will need to get right to work on updating your opinion research as quickly as possible. And John and I would be working through the month of December to update the questionnaire so that interviews can be conducted beginning January 4th. The reason for this is we would like to be able to advise city staff and the city council as early as possible in 2016 what your various options may or may not be and advise you on a strategic plan on moving forward. If planning for a November 16 measure, as you are aware, the deadline for placement on the ballot will be the first week in August for a voter measure. So we would utilize a period between February and June to engage your public further and build greater community-wide teamwork and consensus on the vision moving forward. And with that, I think that John and I are available to take questions as appropriate. Great. I will um, ask, I will have questions from the council in a minute, but first we're gonna have public comment, so don't go far. At this time, as stated at the beginning of the meeting, our public comment time is that uh, anybody can come up and speak for three minutes. Please state your name and city of residence. Is there any public comments? Judy Shea, Desert Hot Springs. I'm a little confused. I was on the original committee that did the utility tax and parcel tax before this uh, renewal group came in. Um, one thing I didn't hear mentioned or, or presented here was, is this just gonna be renewal of the 2% or not, if going forward, we're not gonna try to increase it? Because this was supposed to sunset in just a few years, you know, five years or whatever it was, when we implemented this. And of course, it just keeps getting extended. So on that, on that part, well, why don't we just make it forever rather than going through this process every so many years? I think that would be more feasible than going through this process every five years or 10 years or whatever it is. Um, but I would like to know specifically, are we staying with the 2% or not? Thank you for your comments. So we'll get staff or someone to answer your question after the comments are done. And I'd be more than willing to help in any regards with this process since we went through it umpteen years ago and Richard Cromwell was the one in charge and Green was the attorney at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lou Stewart, um, honorable mayor, distinguished council members, diligent staff. Um, Judy's right, you know, I mean, that's how that was a pa these uh, measures were passed originally by promising the citizens of Desert Hot Springs that they would sunset, that this wasn't going to be an eternal tax on them. And it looks like you're in that same position again where you're going to be telling them, well, it's just for a matter of years. It seems odd, too, that um, considering the amount of money that's going to be spent on this contract, that it hasn't been put out for RFP. Um, when you're talking about $144,600, you need to get competing bids. And of course, really though, there should be no RFP at all because the money really shouldn't be spent. That's a large chunk of change and it cuts into the reserves that the city is building up again. If the council wants to raise taxes on the residents of Desert Hot Springs, who already have the heaviest tax burden of any city in the valley, they should make the case themselves. They shouldn't spend 144,000 for a slick PR firm. I was looking at that presentation. Those didn't look like uh, surveys to me. Those look like fear-based push polls to influence opinion. The same groups that opposed measures F and JJ last year and brought outside super PACs now want to raise taxes and reach into your pockets to pay for the PR firms 
to convince you that taxes are good and necessary. Uh, yes, there are, tax, there are taxes sunsetting, and there will be a shortfall in 2020, and possibly earlier. That's why the previous council approved a marijuana cultivation tax that will more than offset these shortfalls. And I don't believe that was mentioned uh, when the administrative services director did his projections for the following year with uh, the revenues dropping. Uh, by my reading of the, uh, the uh, sales tax uh, or the uh, marijuana cultivation tax, it should generate $6 million or more. It should more than cover your shortfall without reaching into the citizens' pockets. And of course, don't forget the $2 million in sales tax that Walmart will bring in if they ever get built. So um, I would think that 144000 is too much to consider without the full council here. Uh, the people of Desert Hot Springs have already spoken, and uh, they've rejected two taxes. Uh, and they don't want to pay for the PR blitz to make them change their minds with push polls. So I would ask that you uh, table this item until there's a full council here, until the, uh, Mr. McKee returns from China, so that it can be uh, really considered in some depth. Because I know Joe's worked very, very hard to cut city services and make this, uh, this city fiscally responsible. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. He should be included. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Is there any other speakers? Going once. Is there any other speakers? Twice. All right, we'll close public comments and we'll go to council member questions and comments and discussion. Uh, Mr. Betts is in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, the first question that's gonna be answered in this effort is which tax to go for? That's my understanding. Um, going out there and basically polling the citizens and deciding you know, of all these different tax options that are out there, which one's most likely to pass? And then that information comes back to this council, and then we decide which one we're gonna put forward. Now, there's some differences up here, and I know that in the past we've given Lou Edwards fits um, when they've worked with us uh, way back when on the two taxes that passed. When those were first proposed, it was gonna be twice as much on the homes and nothing on the vacant lots. And I said, if that's the way it's gonna be, I'm gonna vote against it. I'm gonna, you know, I won't vote for this to go forward. And not only will I not vote for it to go forward, I'll campaign against it. And basically threw down a gauntlet that said, you're not gonna pile all this extra tax on the homeowners while other people um, get off without paying their fair share. So that was one difference. Now recently we had uh, another measure that went through which was the exact opposite of that one where we tried to put a tax on the people that aren't paying the, the vacant lots. And that created some differences up here. And what you ended up with was council members and influential members in the community opposing it and uh, it didn't pass. It was very close, 62.7 or something like that. I mean, it was very, very close to passing. It needed, what, 63 and a third? And so, and I'm sure that if Catherine Liu and her company had been here working diligently on that one, we could have overcome um, some of the opposition. But Catherine said it herself, a house divided isn't going to get these measures passed. It's not gonna work. We've seen that twice. Uh, we, you know, we saw it in the last election. Um, so the question is, you go out there and you tell us this one, this one, or this one, these two options are gonna, are, are the best ones to go for. Pick one, it doesn't matter which one's the most likely to pass if there's people up here that don't go for it. Um, if, it's, if, if they came through and said, well, because Measure F, a measure like Measure F was the best because it got so close to passage and with just an extra push, but you will have people up here and developers like Skyboard piling tens of thousands of dollars into an antique campaign opposing it. So even though that's the one that's most likely to pass, it's also the one that's gonna get the most opposition, some of that from people sitting up here. I'll tell you right now, if there's something that's gonna pile more on top of the homeowners, I'll tell you the same thing I told you before, I'm not going for it. The property tax on the homes is too much. Um, 
I, you know, I was going to bring a copy of the bill here, but we've all seen our tax bill. The amount of fees and other taxes on the bill more than double what the Proposition 13 tax is. So now you had said, and I got a question for you. You had said vetting more than two revenue options dilutes the, and I need you to help me with that, please. Yes, thank you, Council Member. Um, I will respond to your question and also comment quickly on some of the discussion previously. I do want to emphasize to the uh, Council and members of the listening public that, first of all, our services are carefully sequenced. It is possible to terminate at your will at any time. And I say that because, in fact, we don't know if your constituents would be interested in the proposals that we would test at this time. So John and I would enter this process, as we have in the past, with an open mind. It is entirely possible that we will discover in the survey process that no revenue measure is possible. And in fact, the community may wish additional efficiencies or cuts, which is also a series of questions that we will ask in the interest of being balanced and thorough in the study. To respond uh, to your question, council member, yes, it is ideal because information overload is, is um, a reality to allow us to fully test two options of greatest interest uh, to the council and the city because the margin of error will increase if we cut up the survey too many times. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that was my point here is that if you can only go out and test two options, the first step is we get to decide which options are and are not on the table and at least with the majority of the council up here. And my guess is that if you go out there and try and do a measure F type thing, you'll have the same option, the opposition that you had before because you, I mean, you know, that's the elephant in the room and there's also a donkey in the room. Sorry, but uh, that, that's just the reality of this process up here. So I, I don't know where you, you go with that one, but, and then we've also, last thing I'll say is we've, we've got some challenges. The past measures made promises. And when I hear from people, that's, you know, that's something that we got to overcome this time. And um, the biggest challenge though, is going to be council unity. Are we all going to come together and, and come up with something that's going to work and will what we come up with meet what you say will pass? I think to, uh, Councilman, to expand on Catherine's point, I think we could, we could thoroughly test a couple, but I think uh, in total we could probably test concepts for about four different types of taxes. So there would be some, some variation of, of types of measures that uh, that you would, uh, we would test in this survey. We are finding statewide, and in most cities these days, voters are very supportive of maintaining their current services, not wanting cuts. In the situation of the tragedies here we've had lately, we have uh, seen significant renewed interest in making sure that, needless to say, public safety is enhanced, is improved and not cut, and a wide variety of services that might uh, affect voters uh, are, are polling, and the support for these kinds of measures is polling at an all-time high, not just the last month or so, but for this entire year. Um, we find very strong support for voters uh, wanting to continue and, and, have, and improve the services they, they currently have. That's your take right now. That's the that's the climate right now. Is it that, that is that is generally generally the climate right now for for most voters. Most there should be a, about ten either ten to fifteen measures on the statewide ballot. Also, not all finance measures, but measures addressing a number of different issues. And voters voters are looking as they see um, the world in chaos. Some would say the nation in chaos that they're looking to their local communities, their local leaders. You are the most trusted of all the political leaders, uh, and they're looking to their local cities, counties, school districts, community colleges to basically advise them on enhancements, improvements uh, in services across the board. And we're, we're finding a very strong trend in that. And, and you had said that as you go and you do this, 
we could have this be a go or no go step as far as the dollars go. Go out there, get us information, come back, and if we hit an impasse, there's no sense going forward. Um, the reason I asked you about the climate is because I personally think it's a little rushed. I know that 2020 is looming, but I just, uh, my view, just, you know, it's not as expert as yours is, is that uh, I'd like to see some more time on this. I think we've got some options uh, coming for revenue generation. Another question I have is the same one one of the speakers had is the voters just decided that they want to have a cultivation tax. They, they counted on a cultivation tax. They passed that. That did pass. Um, and now we just delayed the implementation of that cultivation tax because we want to have a study session on that. We're rethinking that one already. So you can see the, the council charts a course and then already we're backing off on that one because we want to study it some more. Uh, the voters gave us clear indication they want a cultivation tax. We're not even giving that a chance to work yet. Right. And 63 percent, 62, 63 percent is a landslide in any, in most every election. You needed basically two thirds, mm -hmm. so you were short two or three percent. But um, I think it was 130 votes. Somebody yes. managed to yes. suck off of that with uh, yes. uh, help through the Inland Empire Taxpayers Association. Are there any more comments that you have, that. Mr. Betts? Any more questions for um, the some questions? I'm having. Yes, I'm not done yet. You're making a general comment about. Huh? You're making general comments. I was just wondering if you were done. There's other council members that have comments too. Let them have at it. Thanks, Councilmember Parks. Yes, um, I remember very well working with you. Can you turn your mic, please? Thank you. See, I don't turn it on anymore. <laughs> you anyway. have to when you speak, though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I remember very well working with you in 2009 and 2010. And uh, it was a great relationship. Um, the thing that, that I like, and that is that you do the surveys, and then you tell us whether or not you feel we have a chance of going forward with, a, with, with the tax, and whether or not we will win. You're, 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 you're right on when it comes to saying, uh, yes, you've got the votes, and um, you know, we've, we've tested the waters and you can go forward with this. But in, in, in the other side, you can test the waters and come back to us and say, your people are not ready. You don't need to go forward with that this November. You need to back off. You need to show the community that you're, you can get along, that, um, you know, that you've, you've got uh, some things going for you again. So, um, that's that's the reason I prefer having you do this, is to let us know what we have to do to get these people to work with us in making sure that we have all the public safety revenue that we can generate. And you know, we talked, I talked earlier the possibility of a public services district rather than a UUT or a PT, you know, let those die, let those go by the wayside and, and do a citywide um, public safety district where everybody's taxed exactly the same and that it would cover all, all of the elements of the public safety budget, which is fire, police, animal control, code enforcement, and what else? No, graffiti. Oh, I thought you said graffiti. No, I didn't. There's five things that we have to pay out of our public safety budget. It's just not police. And I think that's, that's hard for some, some, they say, well, why can't you pay for it out of all that? Well, we, there's five different uh, budget items that have to come out of that public safety budget. So, um, and I would like it to go in perpetuity. So, uh, you know, when you're out there and you're, and you're doing your survey, you know, I'd like to get a feel, you know, is, is this something that, that we can go forward with or should we just kick back and work on it a little bit later? That's my comment. That's, that's essentially what the poll is trying to do. We're trying to, we're trying to assess for you what your voters' interests are, needs are, perceptions are about uh, being included in this decision-making, frankly. We're trying to quantify that. And you find that most voters these days 
one of the reasons polls keep being successful and people are answering them because voters want to be heard. They want to give you their opinion. They don't think very many people listen to them and they want to be heard on some of these issues. Councilwoman Zavala. Uh, given, given that there were some issues um, presented regarding the fee for this study, just to clarify, uh, according to staff, this is uh, money that's coming out of savings from other contracts. So it's not necessarily money that um, we're going to be losing for other projects, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. Um, another question would be, given that you are allowing us to test about four tax measures, do we as a city council have the ability to um, have input as to which measures are put on the ballot or on the survey? Yes, we embrace the diverse perspectives that we know we will receive from the city through the city manager's office. We will also work diligently and additional comments and perspectives from other community stakeholders who may wish to have input. We do have to be careful to protect the integrity of the survey itself. So we know that this is investment uh, for the city. So it's very, very important to us that the survey results that we provide you not be biased or skewed and undue discussion in a public arena of the actual questions or the structure will do that. But short of that, yes, we welcome input and suggestions and ideas and we'll do our best to simplify and deploy and structure the survey accordingly. Okay, and then another thing that uh, came up was, you know, the fact that we may potentially have uh, tax revenues from other uh, businesses like the cultivation facilities. Um, and I just kind of wanted to give uh, a short comment about that because uh, as of right now, for example, I know uh, the city staff is looking at this from the perspective of looking at what's going into the budget right now. And as of right now, we don't have um, any taxes coming in from cultivation facilities. And I think oftentimes it's important to remember that those uh, projected tax revenues are not necessarily set in stone. So, and and a lot of those projections are based off of uh, the completion of the the, um, the build out of those different facilities. And as it's written on the different uh, development agreements right now, uh, some of these cultivation facilities will have up to 10 years to complete, to finish the completion of those projects with the ability to ask for a one-time five-year extension to those 10 years. So you're potentially looking at cultivation facilities that have upwards to 15 years to complete their projects, which means that we can't be counting on those uh, tax revenues um, in their entirety for about 15 years. And public safety is an issue right now. Uh, so I just want to stress that it's important to realize how the need to prioritize this. And uh, I know that $144,000 sounds steep, but I think the public clearly prioritizes public safety. So that's just my comment on that. Thank you. I'm going to make a few comments, and then we have a second round coming up of possible questions. Um, how did we get around the RFP policy at the city council house? Mr. Mayor, due to, um, you know, just timing and where we are right now in terms of trying to get a measure on the ballot, um, uh, I and then talking to uh, Catherine Liu um, and the success that we've had with her in the past, I was proposing to bring that forth to you. Um, our going out for an RFP, you're looking at 60 days and then probably another 30 days for interviews. And then I don't want to put us in a position where we were at the last election where we had 30 days to really market this um, um, ballot measure. Uh, we really need to hammer this home because we need the POA on our side on this one to really sell this one. And I need that, that additional time to really sell this and push this forward. So it's a time of uh, importance and, and timing at this point. Um, the, uh, 
characterizing measure F and measure uh, the measure F on council members up here being opposed to it is it's not a correct characterization of what happened in that election. Uh, you're absolutely right that you have to be unified. Um, I did a lot of research from different organizations and property owners uh, throughout our city, understanding that at Measure F, if proposed at one rate, would not pass because they would oppose it, warning the city council at the time against that. I never campaigned against it, and that characterization should not have been made up here. I don't believe anybody would, would campaign against any measure up here if it was properly presented to the people of Desert Hot Springs and or developers, land providers, anyone that has a stake in Desert Hot Springs if it was properly presented and all the issues were vetted. I think it's important that we look at multiple options. I would like to see the first survey done quickly to see where we stand and then make decisions past that. Um, $144,000 is a lot of money for our city to spend at this time, but what's been set up here is also very important. We, even though 2020 seems so far away, it's not. And we have to take a couple bites at the apple, then we need to do that as soon as possible. Um, the bigger picture uh, of what Ms. Zavala was talking about is Cultivation is important to our tax base in the future, but probably farther in the future than we really realize. The current facilities that are gonna be developed probably won't see any tax revenue until 2017 off of those. So somehow a tax revenue needs to be um, implemented before 2020. Measure A, I believe it was, uh, we had a, options on that. Do we lower the tax, keep the tax where it is, or raise the tax. And after the surveys were done, it was keep the tax where it's at. We want the police, we want the amount of police officers we have and firefighters, but we don't want you to raise our taxes. So that's where we landed in that one. So that was important to realize. Having those surveys in front of you help you make the best decisions you can so you can unify as a city council and as a city on the measures set forth. The reason the last two measures have failed because of those facts right there. The city was not unified in the decision making. Um, I'm having a hard time because we did set a policy about RFPs in our community and especially with this amount of money being spent. I think your firm has proven themselves to our community. Um, so I, I'm going to listen to some other comments here before I make my decisions. Mr. Betts, you're back in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was really intrigued by the uh, comment down at the other end of the dais. Everybody taxed exactly the same. I uh, I got no problems with that one, but uh, wait and see if that's what ends up shaking out in a potential uh, parcel tax scenario. But uh, that would be everybody, not just homeowners. Um, um, Council Member Zavala asked a good question, how do we decide which revenue measures? And I think I was just gonna, you're gonna take the input from us. Um, what does it cost to get us to the first go or no go point? I will put my reading glasses on. Holly, go to the next question. And while you're looking that up, I'll, I'll uh, say that it's not gonna be 15 years before we start to see tax revenue from the cultivation. Um, we certainly won't see full tax revenue from that, and I agree with you that we shouldn't be uh, counting on that entirely. We're, you know, counting what do you call it? counting our chickens before they're hatched on that one. But uh, um, the, my my point was just to clarify that the voters are expecting that that's what's going to happen, and I guess I'm getting into their heads a little bit on how this is playing out there in Peoria. Um, so. Um, that, that was my point on that. So what, what does it cost to get us to a first go and no go point? I would suggest a not to exceed 40,000. Okay, that makes it easier. Um, what I'd like to do, Mr. Mayor, is um, I, I don't think we're gonna lose anything if we wait till January. Um, I know time's tight. I'm not entirely convinced we need to rush this through on 2016. You may be sitting there saying, no, you're wrong, you're dead wrong. Um, I think we got more time than that. That's been my speculation. So I'd like to continue this until uh, the first meeting in January. So Mr. Councilmember McKee can be here and some other people can get comfortable with some other questions they might have. 
But if I don't get a second, then we go on and vote. Is that your motion? That's the motion. Can you please put that? He's going to put it on the screen, and then he can press motion. This is putting it in January when we make sure that all city council members are yeah, present and right. we have the ability to ask more questions. So. First meeting in January. Councilman Parks. I'm, I, I'm hesitant to support. Mike. I'm hesitant. Mike. Pardon? Get it, get it. Oh, there you go. I'm hesitant to support this motion only because I remember 2009 and I remember 2010 and how long it took, um, how many communications with the, with the public, how many f flyers that went out, how many um, surveys, uh, you know, and, and what they had indicated is they will have information to bring back to us <clears throat> in January. Am I right or wrong? Our objective would be to be able to provide some initial data points towards the end of the month, yes. And of course, uh, we, have, we defer to the wise judgment of the council and your process and the timing. I will only state that I have advised other agencies not to go beyond this month. Really, um, many of our agencies preparing for 2016 began their efforts last year. So I would be personally reluctant at the request of city staff on the basis of our past partnership, we agreed to come and be considered at what we considered a very late timetable. And just uh, one other point about the, the the 16 election. I think one of the one of the reasons that so many jurisdictions are going to the ballot or look exploring on the ballot of 2016 is this is a presidential open seat, so the the turnout should be at the maximum for most every city. Usually, the higher the turnout, the more likely uh, you are to all pass these kinds of measures. The millennials come out. Minority voters are voting more. Women are voting more, um, and the the lower the turnout, usually starts to decrease chances of of, of success on these measures. And this is why you're seeing, as Catherine said, most baseline polls have already been done during this year. Some some as far back of January of this year, to basically have enough time to prepare, and compete. Frankly, with you're going to have a number of jurisdictions around you also looking at and preparing for to go on the, the same ballot, whether it's the county, whether it's uh, other jurisdictions around you. Everyone's looking at this November two, 2016 turnout as the optimal time to pass these kinds of measures. Okay. Any more comments? Yes. Okay, so just to uh, clarify with you, so you're saying that uh, waiting till January would not be advisable given the timeline? Again, we wish to be very respectful of the city's process and your deliberations. I will only say that the very straightforward advice I've given other agencies approaching us at this standpoint is that it is a little late in the calendar, and we have been reluctant to uh, serve those other agencies on that basis. We are here this evening because of the strength of, of our past partnership, and um, I can say this with all affection and respect, we know that this is a feisty, prideful, diverse community, and so we expect <laughs> robust feedback and suggestions and ideas. And so we were very hopeful, given your timetable, to make up the time by frankly imposing ourselves on you during the holiday break so that we could begin the interviews January 4th. That, that is our best advice, of course, but we do defer to the wise judgment of the council. More comments? 
I mean, from the polling, polling uh, standpoint, you're, you're basically going to lose about a month and a half if we can basically get in the field before the 15th of January, get your results within, within a couple of weeks. Basically, if, you, if you're going to put it back a month, you're losing almost a month and a half, and that is a month and a half or two months that you're able to communicate and interact with your community. And since there is so much competition for so many of these measures, you want to have as long as possible and as many opportunities to interact with your constituents because you're you're looking at um, you know July you're going to have to make a decision if you put this on the ballot it's, it's due in August so every month in January February March that you're losing communicating and interacting is lost time to to interact with voters any more comments just one quick comment Okay, well, uh, I think the fact that it's 40,000 for the first go, no go uh, scenario and the fact that it's a pressing issue and you're right, it is a presidential election and we do have a higher voter turnout during that time, which I think is great because it's more inclusive and representative of the constituency here in the city. And so with that, I, you know, I think at any point, it's like you mentioned, we have the opportunity to sever the, the agreement, but um, I think it's an important issue and public safety is a priority for this community. I have a couple comments real quick and I, I trust in our staff and the direction they're trying to go, but everything in my body keeps saying, stop, put the brakes on. You got a, You got a new city council sitting up here and we haven't had a study session, we haven't had time to put our opinions on the table. You're gonna go and start putting opinion polls out there on what? You're gonna put opinion polls on what you think is best for our community and um, at this time or what staff gives you, but we as a city council really haven't sat down. I have some ideas that I would like to put forth that are outside the box on actually taxing just the property owners of our community that I think might be able to. I would love to get um, a, a bigger picture from our financial consultants on projections of tax taxation that we've already put forth, projections on where we should go. I know you believe, it is an emergency, it's not an emergency, it is a, a, it is imperative that we move fast if we want the measure to be on the December or the November 16th ballot. I get that, but we have about six or seven good bites at the apple here if we want to move forth for the 2020 tax measures, I believe. Um, I understand where our staff's going and I, I believe in what our city manager's trying to do to move this forward, but again, I just, I think we need to hold on and wait for other council member to get back. I would love to have a, a, a study session on this item that's a full hour and a half to talk about this because we're going to be giving you direction on what's gonna impact the residents of our community for years to come. I have a hard, I have a real problem with taxation when it sunsets. I was given a lecture when I was first elected on the measure, uh, measure A in 2009 on why should he support it and he would never support me again as a member of this community or on this council because he was promised it was gonna sunset and he was not gonna to have to pay taxation again. So there's a, there's a lot to do here, and uh, I just I I'm going to support the continuation if the council goes that way. The current motion on the table, because I think we just need to slow down for a second, take a look at it, and go forth from there. Yeah, I have. May I say something? Um, Mr. Betts was in the queue next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to point out that our oh, staff he never went out. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm back in. Sorry. Oh, he did. The um, <laughs> just want to point out that what is it uh, after this meeting? staff's on vacation for two weeks so you're not going to get a hold of them anyhow and it's only a week after that that we're back here for a council meeting so um, I mean they're off for two weeks so you're not going to get any work done by them general staff's off for two weeks our department has already stated they'd be in if needed for work okay. all right anyhow we're we're not going to have access to them for any type of discussions yes we are is there is there a question for the consultants huh you'll be here New Year's Eve New Year's week Oh, okay. New Year's Eve? We're going to be here New Year's Eve? <laughs> I'd like to move this item. So if there's any specific questions for the consultants who have May to catch a plane in, in, tw in 35 question. minutes. So is there a specific question for the consultants? I have no question for the consultant, but I have a statement that I would like okay. to make. 
like I said, I worked with Lou Edwards and their group. I have all the confidence in the world that they know what to go forward with this community. And letting them at least get a month off the ground so that we can come back in January and move it forward, uh, I, I think is the best, the best idea. Call okay, questions. at this time, I'm sorry, were you I thought you were finished. Okay, go ahead. At this time, there is a motion on the table to continue the item. You withdrawed your second, is that correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's open to come back as a study session, I mean, I think that's great. I didn't realize that was on the table until you mentioned it. Mr. Betts asked to continue to, to January 5th. I think I will put it on a study session and as an action item uh, on the next agenda. So I think it's important that we what study it. What happened to our motion? Wait a Your minute. Your motion wait, is wait to continue the item to the next available meeting. And we had meeting. a motion and a second. The Let's second withdrawn. Okay, so we're. Um, so are we? Th is the motion to put it back on the agenda? I think you said in first week of January. Continue this until January. Okay, I, as the mayor, I'm going to ask the specific questions. Let's get the answers, Mr. Betts. You asked to continue this item till January 5th, so Mr. McKee will be part of the, con uh, the conversation. Is that correct? Was that your motion? Motion to continue to January 5th. Yes. Okay. You seconded. It. Did you want to withdraw your motion from that? Well, are we going to put it on the study session, as you mentioned, or are we going to vote on it on January 5th? Yeah, as I said, stated, I was going to put it on the study session for discussion and an administrative uh, item for possible vote in that meeting also. So you'll have two items. You'll have a study session on it. If we want to continue it after that, you can do that because it will be on there for action also. Okay. Well, if we're going to have a study session, then I second it. Any other comments? Please vote. Mr. Mayor, a quick point of order. Yes. I, I understand um, Councilwoman Parks and I will be working on policies and procedures, and one of the things we're going to need to work on is whether we're going to follow Roberts or Rosenberg's on these motions, withdrawn, seconded, Correct. motions made. That's, a big, that's the big difference between those two. So we need to get that settled. Um, okay. I'm you sitting here operating adopted. in a different frame of mind. I know we already adopted Rosenberg. Yeah. yeah. I, I believe we followed all the rules necessary, yeah, we did. We did. and there was a withdrawal, and she made her withdrawn. With huh? Not the, withdrawed. Thank you for the for the correction. <laughs> Councilmember Parks, if you got something to say, please wait for your turn. Thank you. Um, with that, we're going to take a five-minute break. Five. <laughs>
One more minute. All right, everybody, if you find our seats, we're going to get started again. We still have quite a few items to get through. I like to bang it three times. No, I like three. <laughs> Item number one in our public hearings is a consideration of a conditional use permit 07-15 for a type 20 off-sale beer and wine alcohol license for market, Desert Market located at 12285 Palm Drive at the southwest corner of Palm Drive and Buena Vista Avenue in the CG General Commercial District. Application Acting community, Ms. Avala, oh, there she is. Uh, acting community development director, uh, well, he's not acting anymore. Senior. Yeah, you, senior planner. Uh, senior now. planner now, Rich Malikoff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this, um, we're requesting Mr. and the applicants Mayor, requesting. We were having a hard time hearing up there. If you have some conversation, please take it outside at this point. The general meeting is back in order and we're in a public hearing. Thank you. We're requesting to continue this item to January 19th. Um, if anybody is here to speak on the item, we can open the public hearing and they can put in their um, comments for the record or they can come back on the 19th. At this time, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody to speak on this item? Please come forth, state your name and city of residence. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Staff, Person of the Week, Marti Magana, our wonderful city manager, um, and uh, the audience watching at home and everyone behind me. I'm Michael Burke, a Desert Hot Springs resident. I live on a coma just a few blocks away from this location. Um, I kind of have slight mixed feelings on this. I understand there's a lot of uh, nearby locations that also sell uh, beer and wine. Um, and uh, we don't want someone, a tourist or uh, new people looking to buy homes to drive through the city and see a bunch of clusters right next to downtown of, uh, of uh, uh, basically liquor markets. However, I've been inside this place. I go in there quite often. Um, it's quite clean. The customer service is fabulous, much better than the other stores nearby. Uh, hopefully they're not watching. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, they're... Business model is slightly different. They have, um, they're uh, planning on providing uh, uh, fresh food and uh, some other stations. They have some good ideas there. Um, and my biggest concern is they're this far along. They were expecting to get this to begin with. It's kind of, uh, 
unfortunately, just pull the rug from under them. A suggestion I would have is perhaps uh, put an ordinance in place that would clarify how many uh, uh, businesses that can sell beer and alcohol within a uh, certain uh, nearby each other or close to downtown, et cetera, for the future so they don't get this far along in the process and been told, no, you can't do it. So that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, That's Mr. All. Burke. Is there anybody else who would like to comment on this item? Please state your name and city of residence. I'm really nervous, sorry. <laughs> Take your time. Um, my name is Heather O'Donnell. Um, I live um, on Granada. And um, um, everybody knows I'm on nextdoor.com and, and I read the press releases all the time and I have a bunch of them on here for the DUIs. I think that, um, it, that sh they should not get their liquor license, not only because we are trying to, this is the one thing we're trying to stop is all the, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. Take your time. Um, there's all these, you know, everything that's going on in, in this town, I and mean, we have, our crime rate is, is extremely high. We, ha we have so many arrests in, since November 25th, we've had 14 arrests already, thank, thank goodness for our police department. Uh, so it's we we just there's it's I have studies according to the recent research by the Prevention Research Center and others neighborhoods where bars restaurants liquor and other stores are close together suffer more frequent incidences of violence and other alcohol related problems also um, a study of 74 cities in LA County a higher density of alcohol outlets was associated with more violence even when levels of unemployment age ethnic and racial char characteristics and other community characteristics were taken into account a six-year study of changes in numbers of alcohol outlets in 551 urban and rural zip code uh, areas in California, an increase in the number of bars and liquor and convenience and grocery stores were related to an increase in the rate of violence. So I don't believe that they, they, we need another liquor store in Desert Hot Springs. Uh, I th think we need to focus more on getting rid of the crime instead of adding to it. Um, the DHS population is 27,902, and um, in 2007, from citydata.com, they reported to have 802.0 crimes, whereas Cathedral City had 201.0, Pond Springs 431, Pond Desert 285, and India. So we have a very, very high crime rate. Um, with per thousand residents, we have 9.96 percent just in DHS alone, and 4.2 in California, where ever the crime index, where 100 is safest, DHS is safer than only 8 percent of U.S. cities. Your chances of becoming victim in DHS <coughs> of a violent crime are one in 100, and in California, one in 249. And I think we need to reconsider them getting their liquor license because it's to me, it's just adding fuel to the fire, and that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on this item? Public hearing is open for public comment at this time. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? It's the last opportunity. We will continue this item till the, you need a vote on that. The 19th. You? you want to continue till the 19th? Okay, so there's a, a motion to continue, or I would like a motion to continue to the 19th. Mr. Betts, you had a comment before the motion? Yeah, was it Heather? Um, you're a very good speaker. Did a good job. Um, yeah, I was going to make a motion to continue, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Put that up on the screen. Second. Is there any other comments? Please vote. Mr. City Clerk. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item number two is consideration of conditional use permit 03-15 and a development agreement 04-15 for a proposed medical marijuana cultivation center totaling 1,001,000 square feet in multiple buildings in multiple phases on 35.1 acres at the northwest, northeast corner of Little Morongo Road and Dillon Road in the Light Industrial District. Uh, senior Planner Rich Melnikoff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so today we have a conditional use permit in front of you and a development agreement for medical marijuana cultivation. Uh, mar medical marijuana cultivation is allowed in the industrial district only in our city per your ordinance that you passed last November. Here's the location, the corner of Little Morongo and Dillon Road. Here's the aerial view of the air of here's the aerial view of the site. 
It's surrounded by industrial, also by industrial areas and in, um, retail and, com and also commercial. Um, so the, the location is appropriate. So here's the site plan. There's going to be access off Little Morongo into each of the five phases. So there's five different phases that will go into this project. And um, there will not be, there'll be access um, so that you can go around the building. And with five phases, um, that'll be part of the development agreement. There'll be improvements along Little Morongo, but we also, like the other Little Morongo projects, we've deferred the improvements along Little Morongo until such time that either there's an area-wide improvement plan for the, for the power poles or that there's an area-wide community facilities district that would split the costs evenly among them because we didn't want to see people put in street improvements only to rip them out two or three years later. So that's why we'll get those street improvements, but not right now because we want to find a plan for the power poles first. And these are the elevations of the property. They're basically going to be about 50 foot high buildings. They'll have flat roofs with neutral earth tones, accent colors. They use decorative reveals to break up the building, um, particularly on the long sides of the buildings where they have more decorative reveals so that um, the accent colors and the reveals will um, provide a more attractive appearance from Little Morongo Road. They also um, provided corner winter window treatment at the corner to make the building more attractive. Um, also with the landscaping, um, it's going to go in each phase at a time. And they're not going to, um, as I understand it, if they, as they, they answered at the Architectural Review Committee, that they're going to grade each section as they need it and therefore we didn't require them to put all the landscaping in along the street frontage because it's gonna remain in its natural condition. However, they are required to put in um, a block wall in between each of the phases um, as per the Planning Commission's requirement. Um, the landscaping basically is drought tolerant. It'll meet the requirements of Mission Springs Water District, include Palo Verde trees, olive trees, and acacia and also have shrubs and ground cover, including bougainvillea that will provide color to the site and also prevent people from entering the site by the type of plants that they chose. Um, on the development agreement, um, like the others that you reviewed at the last meeting, um, we're recommending that that get continued so that the um, both parties can review all the different aspects of the development agreement and be able to negotiate the fee. So we're not recommending that you take action on that today, just the conditional use permit. Um, the Architectural Review Committee did, in, did unanimously recommend approval. And the Planning Commission added a few things, um, so I wanted you to know what they had done is they basically s set a policy that they want, they don't want any, um, chain link fencing, they require permanent fencing on all sides, basically the tubular steel or the wrought iron. Um, they're allowed to have temporary fencing between each phase to be chain link, but it has to be removed when the next phase is, is built. And um, they also have to pay their fair share going back to Little Morongo of the signalization at Little Morongo Road. So as people go in, they'll all pay their fair share there and the signal would be get put in. We're currently working with the county on that. Um, there's a few issues with the county we need to work out, but eventually as development goes in, a signal will go in also. The environmental review was a mitigated negative declaration, which had mitigation measures for traffic, biology, and cultural resources. Um, there's a new law on the books AB 52, this was submitted before AB 52, but we did hear from one of the Indian, and AB 52 deals with the Indian tribe's ability to review projects. So we need to route most projects through to not just Agua Caliente, but to any tribe that, that requests to see these projects, and that's any project. And the interesting mitigation measure we got there is that they need to have a tribal representative there during grading to ensure that there's no cultural or sacred artifacts um, being dug up, and if there are, that they're treated appropriately. And 
that basically concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. The applicant's consultant is here, the applicant is here. I'm sure they would all like to talk and I can answer any questions. All right, our next item on the public hearing is questions of staff from council. Does any council member have a question to staff? Council member Betts. We've got to do something to resolve this issue with the power poles. I'm not comfortable that we're not going to do any improvements. It's not practical those poles are ever going to move. It's way too expensive. They're too big of power lines. you got to come up with some kind of solution. That, that a solution for us that says these guys are going to know what they're going to do and we're going to, I, I want these improvements put in on Little Morongo. Right now, are they, are they putting any improvements on Little Morongo? Right now, we've got a, a very narrow road, a lot of traffic, a dirt shoulder that's not even a paved emergency lane. There's not even, you can't even stripe for the right hand edge of the road because there's no right hand edge. What's getting done on this, on Little Morongo when these guys are going in? Uh, right now, according to the way we have the development agreement structured, it's uh, requested that it be a deferred improvement. Total deferred. So this this huge project goes in, and there's nothing on Little Morongo. Well, if you do them if you do them in piecemeal, um, it will end up looking like a portion of Hacienda where you have a curb line, and then you don't have a curb line, and then you, it's just two lane roadways, and then it's four lane roadway, and um, that could be hazardous. Um, and the idea is to defer the development of this or the improvements of this to where we get enough money where we can all go do it in one shot. That'll be and 100 years from now. It'll never happen well, in this and, town. And it's something that we're talking also with Edison because you're right, it's costly to relocate those lines. They, they will never go underground because they're above the um, their, their transmission lines. So uh, they, they cannot be I, I think we need to come, somebody needs to come back to us with uh, the design Figuring that those poles are going to stay right where they are, it's not practical to move them. It's going to be way too long, and then the improvements in front of each place are going to go in place, and, and something's got to be worked out in Little Morongo because I'm really not comfortable with the thought that this nice, beautiful project is going to go in, and Little Morongo is still not even going to have any kind of improvement whatsoever. One other thing to add to the list um, for Little Morongo is that the development agreement is worded in such a way that each year that you approve, you review the development agreement, if let's say in two years or even a year that you see that basically a whole area of Little Morongo has been developed and you haven't seen any action, then you could say this needs to be done now and that would be, that's the development agreement gives you the ability to say that at any time in the future. But the development agreement has basically about a 10 year life and it, it could go that long but you could before that point, say, this is enough, two years later, I want it done now. Something's gotta get worked out on this thing. It's just not acceptable to uh, have Little Morongo stay in exactly the same condition it's in now with all this development going on. I, I, I've gotta hear from the applicant on this one when it's his time. That's my immediate question for staff. Um, when, are you, when are you gonna get this done? When are you gonna solve this problem? Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Ms. Uh, Park. Yes, um, most of the activity East, on the east side, right? The activity in the buildings? Yeah, you know, but they're gonna pick up and, they have to come and pick up the, the cultivation, correct? They must, from the looks, they have some bays where they're, they're gonna go and pick up. There's not a huge amount of employees to the average, um, to the average cultivation facility. This one, since it's 1.1 million square feet, will have more employees than all the rest that you've looked at. But they'll, um, they'll go in and they'll pick it up at the bay window, at the bay doors. Okay, and those are on the, on the east side. Right, but they'll enter that at Little Morongo at so, each one of the five phases. So they'll, they'll There'll be five. There's Little five Morongo. driveways on Little Morongo to each of the phases. Then they'll go around to the back. Yes. Okay. Okay. Lanes. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Now, on the the whole purpose of not this is my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong. The whole purpose of not doing anything on Little Morongo is the potential of the widening of Little Morongo, which would then 
need to move the light the, the pole standards that that's half of it the other half of it is the reason that we didn't want to require them to there there we did float around temporary plans that they could do and one of the things that i've heard over the years that developers really hold cities responsible for is they don't like to do things twice so we didn't want to make them go do a plan and then have to rip it out in five years when the street gets widened and we have our plan together. That's why we thought we would defer the improvements till the plan comes together and there's a plan for the power poles. We have the whole area developed and we have many developers that'll participate in the process. That was the thinking. Um, if the city council decides that they want all, all of this improved now, then we could change the conditions on the ones that are going forward. I would like, of course, to see Little Morongo widened as quickly as possible because right now it's just this little two-way road and it's going to have traffic like crazy when all of these cultivation facilities uh, are built between Two Bunch and Dillon along Little Morongo. So I, I don't know how the rest of the council feels, but... I think we should work somehow, work on, on widening Little Morongo and dealing with those poles as quickly as possible. What was that? Hold, hold on, I have some comments and then uh, you can go again on a second round. Um, I have some concerns with the project also and um, I don't know if you can answer these questions. I, I wrote down power poles right away. I think this is a major concern. I think the city failed years ago not to mandate to Southern California Edison when they moved those poles to make sure they were out of the right away. Whether it was our fault or not, we should have, well, I say we collectively, none of us were even there when this was taking place. Um, but it has hindered multiple projects along Mission or, um, Little Morongo uh, Avenue. We had a church that wanted to build there and multiple acres and can't build there now because they couldn't afford the $200,000 to move the pole that Southern California Edison is going to charge them to move that pole. So how many poles are, are is this project effect? I don't know, um, the applicant probably has that number or their consultant, I don't have that exact number. I'll ask the applicant that when they get up for, for questioning. My concerns are is when you move those poles, you have to move all the poles is what Southern California Edison has told us. So this is really concerning to me. It also concerning to me is I don't have a problem with you phasing in your street um, improvements as you phase in the project itself. But if you're going if your first phase is going to be at the corner, that whole corner needs to be um, fully uh, developed, uh, and it needs to have street lighting and everything. So um, I would I would be open to phasing in the rest of it as it goes along, but that street that corner needs to be fully developed. Um, I know you're asking today, I, I was going to make a comment about the, the uh, development agreement. We have a lot of discussions about development agreements. I, would, I wouldn't suggest our council approve that tonight because we have a lot to do on that. But the CUP, we'll have to, we'll have to talk more about that as the developer gets up. Ms. Zavala, you're in the queue, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Betts. I was just going to go ahead and echo that sentiment regarding the um, little Morongo uh, street improvements. And then just aside from that, and I know we're probably going to speak more about the uh, development agreements, um, but I do have some concerns um, regarding the size of the cultivation facility. Um, you know, it is rather large, and I just want to make sure that we end up with a completed project, uh, given the time span that's allotted for this. And I just want to make sure that, um, you know, it's feasible. Thank you, Mr. Betts. So what I want to see is the practical solution here is those poles aren't going to move. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be a major project, and it's holding up everything that comes along. So staff needs to come up with an engineering plan that accounts for those poles being just where they are, and that every development goes in like that, and you don't ask the developer to come back later and redo it. That becomes our baby someday if it ever gets done, and it won't. Those poles are never going to move. That's my prediction. And 10 years down the road, somebody is going to say, well, geez, why didn't you move those poles? And, it, you know, you should have done something, but it just ain't going to happen. 
it's, 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 it's held up a church, it's held up everything else. One of the issues that, you know, why we're uh, supporting the deferment of the, imp of the improvements of these or moving the, relocating these power lines is because we haven't had our general plan update done. So as part of the general plan update, we do a traffic analysis, and that traffic analysis is gonna tell us right now whether Little Morongo is gonna be 120 foot wide or 160 foot wide. That will let us know and determine where those power lines should be relocated. So to help us get there, and that's kind of why we're recommending that you defer this, because we don't know. It could, you could relocate the lines and they'll end up still being in the roadway. But you're saying I, I don't no know that improvements now. whatsoever. No, that we're road. saying we're deferring the improvements. I, I, you're saying this place is going to be up, operating. There's going to be driveways off of Little Morongo. Somebody's going to be coming down this two-lane road. There's not even a lane to turn out, and they're going to be turning into this project with no improvement whatsoever. I'm just trying to get a handle on what you're well, suggesting. There, why don't we do this real quick? Why don't we get the applicant to speak to it, and maybe that'll answer some of our questions and get the ball rolling. I Thank you, Mr. Mar uh, Mr. Magana. And uh, you are? Mr. Mayor, my name is Nicole Christ. I'm with Terra Nova Planning, and I assisted the city in preparing the app the staff report this evening. I wanted to clarify two things. First of all, the applicant is required to do all of the improvements on Dillon Road, as well as a transition corner to the satisfaction of the city engineer, so that the transition from Dillon Road to Little Morongo will be properly improved. The applicant is also required to make a connection to the existing Little Morongo if Little Morongo is not widened, so that there will be the dry, there's, there will be a physical connection between the existing Little Morongo and the site that is improved for driveway. So it, um, no improvements is not entirely correct. There will be full improvements on Dillon Road. That is also their phase one. So the corner will get done first. With the corner that transitions to um, Mor Little Morongo in its current condition, assuming that current condition is still the case when they actually build phase one. And then there will be, as phases develop, if the widening of Little Morongo is not complete, then they will build improvements between the existing Little Morongo and their facility um, so that there is paved access to and from the site at each driveway location. Yes. Okay. Thank you for those clarifications. So the pavement, describe for me, is there gonna be a curb that they put in in a gutter? For, for their driveways. On Little Morongo? Yes. What, from Dillon all the way to the for their, their for, the project is proposed to be phased. Okay. So for each phase, can we stop for <laughs> a minute, uh, Rich or City City Clerk? Can you put a map up of the project, the overhead view, so it shows the phases? It might be easier to. Well, we can clear this up as soon as they open the applicant up. We're going to improve this one. Okay. I, I'm just trying to get a picture of what this looks like, and I ain't got one. We're going to put one up Fight. here. There we go. There's. There we go. So. Phase one consists of the first four buildings on the right side of the picture. And this is what we have here, not marked, but it's Dillon Road. Dillon Road On runs, the right-hand side of the picture. Runs north, up and down on the right-hand side of the page. So we need to label those next time we do these drawings. I believe at scale they are labeled, sir. It's okay. just at that scale you can't read it. Okay, thank you. Um, the first four buildings are phase one. So that would be the first part of construction. There is a driveway. that The, the city engineer will approve the design of the corner okay, for can... Little Morongo to can... connect to the existing Little Morongo if Little Morongo has not been widened and and to make that a safe transition where are the poles ultimately where are the poles in there the are five poles and at that scale you can't see them sir but where there would are they be five, located here well the the yeah. poles currently are in the city's right of way they're in the sand um ultimately they would be moved out of the city right of way in, in this and drawing, into the parkway in this drawing where are the poles there are teeny tiny little dots i got that i'm um, talking about in relation to the street you're showing me three lanes of traffic she's here. trying she's going to point watch her there i'll go over there later.
these maps are in your inbox if you didn't have a chance to receive them at full scale. Um, and I do have a set of full scale plans if anyone on the council would like to look at them. This doesn't show me, I looked at them, okay? I looked at these plans. This doesn't show me what's existing and what's gonna be done. I can't tell from this what that street's gonna look like. So I'll just, I'll be quiet right now and just wait to see if they I'm gonna let the rest, if you wanna introduce the rest of the, the applicants if you wanna come up and introduce yourself. Good evening, I'm Bernard Steinman. Um, this is David Welch, my lawyer, and Miller Thacker, the PM, and this is uh, Mike Gill, our architect. So we can answer any questions in regards to that. Um, specifically to the, to the widening, we have no problem. We were planning on doing all those street improvements for that first phase. So I think what you can't see on there is the, uh, the poles right now are in the dirt, and we can either expand that out, put K-rails around the existing pole so that all the improvements are done and completed, um, or however if you guys want to do that. I, I'm just looking for, I'm sorry, it's just such a simple question. Yeah. Right now, I've got a road that's barely wide enough for a car in each direction, and, a very, and then there's been some old ground up street that's been put down for a berm. That's about, what, 10 feet wide? And then how much further is the pole? Another 10 feet? Yeah, the pole is, what, probably 15 feet the off the edge of that? Feet. Okay, but I'm not talking about what you need to do with the poles. I'm just talking about, are you gonna do, where it's ground up pavement that's for a Mr. berm, Bitz, are you gonna pave that? Mr. Bitz, your, the question's been answered multiple times. No, They're it hasn't. In phase, I'm not clear, in I phase an one. In, I'm gonna try to answer. Be zero paving? In phase one, they're gonna pave completely from the road to their driveways, just like it's supposed to be. From the road to the poles? The, road yeah, the, the poles the are pole. gonna be an issue, we know that. We, you've already asked the city staff, give direction no, to the city right. staff to see what we can so do with the poles. I don't know why it's so complicated. <laughs> Because so you're making simple. it too Is there going to be any paving at all yes. on Little Morocco? How many times did everybody say yes? Everybody said Nobody yes. Nobody said yes. I haven't heard of They said yes. She name? said yes. And they said yes. I, and I understand your confusion. We're going to put in Could all the curb and gutter mic, in please? phase one. You need one. to speak into the mic so it can be I'm reported. Sorry. Thank We're you. We're going to put all the curb and gutter in phase one, all the sidewalk. Okay? But for our own sake, we have to get some, dr some drive lanes to get mm -hmm. trucks in and out, workers in and out. So we're going to put a right-hand turn lane to come into it. Ultimately, we may have to lose that when we finally can widen it. And as Bernard says, we'll put up K-rails. It's done in other cities. Uh, we'll do whatever. Okay, so basically. And, and so then finally, the street improvement plans were submitted. Um, uh, Danny's not here. Uh, I believe yesterday. So the, it, that does give you the detail you'll be looking for. So, which shows you what Simple exists and is. The answer is it will not just be, Little Morongo will not look as it does now. No. no. It'll no, actually no, have no, curb, no. gutters, sidewalks, a place like a landscape, car landscape, off the side. Everything, yeah. yeah. Because okay, we fine. want it to be as finished as we can make. Basically, final development, but the poles will still so be. So, it's there. not nothing's going to be done. No, no, no. Okay, well, that's we're, what I was hearing we're from We're pretty staff. much going to do the whole, the whole part of that phase, but the pole is the issue. So, the pole stays right there. It'll still be in the pavement, so you K rail around that. Okay. or whatever you guys Thank want you. to do. While you're that. there, I have a question for you. Will you be signaling the intersection? Are you required to do that? Why not? The, the applicant is not, does, the applicant's traffic will not generate sufficient traffic to warrant the signalization of the intersection. They are conditioned, however, to pay their fair share of signalization of the intersection. And as Rich indicated, the city is working with the county to, to work towards that installation at the appropriate time. Traffic does not currently warrant um, the, the addition of a traffic signal at that location. We're, how far are we off from warranting that? Or do we have to get through a new study? Busy now, but We're still working with the county. They had a few, um, a few concerns on um, how to stripe and how to um, put stop signs in for now. And then we'll eventually, as development goes in, each one will pay its fair share towards a signal that would go into the future when the warrants are met. Well, uh, my, my concern is this, is that you have, a, you have a million square foot development that's going in that's probably gonna be the, the, one of the last developments in that corner. You might have one go across the street, but there's already something there. You have already have a solar farm feet away from that intersection and you have a, um, uh, rock farm, whatever you want to call that thing, um, 
right there at the other corner. So what's going to be developed around there to produce enough money to put the signaling up? Is it going to be on the city's back to signal at the intersection eventually? I mean, I'll have to look at the map more. I, I know you're thinking, you're like, I don't have an answer to that question because I can't see it in my head, but it's something we got to think about. Obviously, they're going to pay their, their, their fair share of it, uh, but we have dictated in the past that developments pay for that and then they get reimbursed. I don't know how much more of a cost it would be for this project, but I, I think there, right now it doesn't warrant it because there's no study to warrant it, but is there enough traffic there to warrant and how soon can we get that study done? Um, I don't have the answer to that at this point in time without the engineer here. What we can do is have um, Mr. Kopecki um, address that to you um, as to when he, his expectation is that the warrants would be met and we can have that information sent to you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, unfortunately we're also dealing with a development agreement and so in the context of the development agreement, if we can convince them to do something that we that is not warranted, we can put that in the development agreement. Well, I don't want to cost you more for your project, but I am concerned about the traffic that will come there. You you might not put enough traffic on the road there to, but eventually your portion is going to need to be paid anyway. So how do we get that those those signal lights up there? I, I think it could warrant signal lights at this point. I think there's more traffic than most believe, and I think our studies are probably outdated at this point, anyways. I know that CVAG is coming through to do more studies on the major arterials, and I don't know how that'll warrant. So I'm not picking on your project. I'm just trying sure. to make sure that we get what we, what the city deserves, and, and safety's done. We have an issue at the far corner up, Little Morongo, and two bunch of palms that we just had a development going in that warrants to just a stop sign needs to have a stop sign there so that accidents can stop happening and people can stop getting injured and we're having trouble just getting a stop sign there because the way the county works is a lot slower than the way the city's going to work so okay. um anyways i'd like to i'd like to stay on top of that and staff to stay on top of that uh miss Savali, you have a question uh, my question is regarding the traffic study. When it's conducted, will it also take into account the fact that there are other cultivation facilities that will also be at Little Morongo? So I can see two right now on the agenda. So just making sure that we're taking those future facilities into account as well. We did do a traffic study for this project to determine that it didn't meet the warrants for a traffic light at this point. When as, diff as development goes in, each development pays to the traffic signal mitigation fund. So that would be more of a cumulative look at Little Morongo all the way up and down it as to where it would need traffic signals. So that would be part of the city's overall plan and eventually become part of the city's um, I forgot what they call it here, the Capital Improvement Fund, to, in, to install a signal there based on our traffic signal mitigation fund. So eventually that's what's gonna happen when the warrants are met, but everybody that's going in, the other cultivation facilities that are you know, in different locations on Little Morongo, they're all paying into the signal mitigation fund also. And then at such time when the warrants are met, then we put it in the, in the, in the Capital Improvement Plan and it can go in paid for by our traffic signal mitigation funds, which is a restricted fund to be used for that. Um, at this time, I'm going to, if there's nothing else you need to add, I'm going to open the public hearing, take some testimony, and we'll give you time to rebut if there's anything. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we, we do that? Well, I was just going to tell you a little bit about myself and, and, the, and the projects itself. Um, just some quick information. My background is in finance, banking, and real estate. Um, I've been in this industry for a while after my mom got sick with cancer and uh, started exploring uh, the positive benefits of uh, medical marijuana. I have currently a delivery service and cultivation center in uh, Inland Empire. I also have uh, one of the 20 licensed uh, retail facilities in Santa Ana through uh, Measure BB. Uh, my team that I have put together, I have, my cultivators have over a century of cultivating experience behind them. My uh, development and political team are some of the best in the industry. Just so you're more clear on, on the plan, how it goes, so there's, uh, there's five phases. Each phase has, uh, if you see the individual buildings in there, the first building will be built. Uh, we're ready to start grading in January. We've already submitted for grading plans. Uh, we should have that built and up and running by the end of next year. Um, 
and each building will be built sequentially every six months after that. The first phase is already funded, and the sequential phases will self-fund itself. So, um, so that kind of answers you know some of your questions on that. Uh, we're working with uh, some of the top environmental efficiency firms um, on analyzing hybrid light, automation, uh, different types of light, LED, so forth. Um, our facilities are pretty energy efficient and high tech, so to speak, as they are right now. We're currently recapturing up to 70% of the water that we use in our cultivation. Currently, right now, that's what we do. So, um, you know, we just we want to work with you guys uh, specifically to uh, help create jobs. I mean, this thing, when it's fully done, should be about a thousand jobs. So, we want to work directly with you and the community to to do training, get you know, get your uh, your people trained and, and working at these facilities. And um, very important, as I've heard from you guys, as it is to us, is security and safety. We're working with some uh, high-level security teams. We've already spoke with, uh, with Dale already about um, coordinating with your own law enforcement to not only secure our building, but that entire area for cultivation. Because I think it's important that we all communicate that um, and, and coordinate our efforts for that. So, um, so that's just a real quick thing if you have any other questions or I appreciate comments. it I'm gonna open up some public comments and then uh, we'll come back for um, rebuttal if needed I'm gonna open the public hearing at this time I'm gonna take public testimony is there anybody in the public that would like to speak please state your name and uh, your residence uh, my name is Mark Moran uh, my address is PO box 1305 La Quinta California 92247 I represent your neighbors um, we are growing a substantial uh, large facility just as these folks are proposing it. Our greatest concern is security. I mean, public, public improvements, that's an important issue for you. But what should be equally important is how it's secured. It's going to have multiple access points that need to be secured. Uh, armed security needs to be on, on site, and they say they're, they're working with some, uh, some folks. We're working with Securitas, uh, and you probably know Securitas because they did work in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, we also use them in Los Angeles. We're also in Santa Ana. We're also in San Diego. One of the things that um, Councilman Betts brings up is public improvements. What we want to do is, with our neighbors, uh, form some sort of CFD and so that we can put in the roads, so that we can, uh, it's going to be real difficult to move those power lines. I don't care what we do, um, because we can't underground them. But if we work with the county and expand the roadway and actually expand it into the county just a little, uh, we can make those road widths work. Um, but what we're, we're not opposed to this project. We think it's massive. Uh, we think it's very ambitious. Unfortunately, it's also uh, come on the radar in both Washington, D.C., with the Drug Enforcement Administration, as well as the state of California. Why do we know this? Because we were contacted by them, um, who very have very strong concerns. And as we have discussed with staff, as we have discussed with council members and now future council members, um, you're doing something very unique here. You're the one of the few places in California, and for, for that matter, in the United States, that is doing cultivation. You're going to bring attention to yourselves. You already have. If you don't do it right, we will all be closed down. None of you will get sales tax or any kind of other tax if somebody screws this up. And there's a really good opportunity to do so. Same concerns that I have with this project, I have with the next project, and so I'm not going to weigh in on that. But we all need to work together. I'm glad to see that they deferred their uh, uh, development agreement so that we can start talking about that fee, because a million square feet should pay more than 380,000 square feet, which is ours, uh, maybe, or maybe nothing. But still, we need to look at that and negotiate that. Again, I am not opposed to this project. None of our folks, our principals, are opposed. We just want to make sure that it's done right, and that's basically up to you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Is there any other speakers in the audience on this item? Mr. Please state your name and uh, 
City of Residence. I'm Thomas George Miller, and uh, thinking about moving to Desert Hot Springs. I'm from born and raised in Whittier, California, President Nixon's hometown. In fact, I was living at the Hoover, four doors, floors down from Nixon's private crib in uptown Whittier. Anyway, I worked for the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad for 20 years, Warren Buffett Railroad. I've had 58 jobs. I lived all over the Western United States. I'm friends with Jerry Brown. And my concern is, if they're gonna build a big project out there, there's gonna be concrete trucks going down that road. So we might as well trash it now and fix it later. And I agree with him, Russell. They're not gonna move those power lines. That's Southern California Edison. Hello. It ain't gonna happen, never. They're too big, you can't fight them. So you gotta do something different, period. Because you need jobs in this town. And I got here two weeks ago, and all the fire hydrants that are made out of brass are ripped off here too. And I looked at the beautiful facility for mental health, I looked at the library, the skate parks. That skate park I ran in today revels the one in Whittier, California, and it's almost as good as the one in Palm Springs. Now, I've talked to the mayor, city council, chief of police in Whittier at Fred St. Ellis, which is a reformatory school built in 1895, closed in 1994, sold to the Canadians for $42 million. And we You're own have to bring your comments it. We back own it. The California to... State. Taxpayers own We're Fred in a Cinellas. public hearing on this item, so you're going to have to make your comments directed to this item or hold your rest of your comments for public comments at the end. Oh, I thought this was for. This, this is, was public comments. No, this is, this oh, is comments on the public me. hearing for this oh, item yeah. only. Well, I say put it through, get it done, make the jobs. If you want to continue your comments on the other things, please feel free to come back at the end of the meeting for oh, public absolutely. comments. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Thank you. and Council. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a nice place here, too. But I couldn't find it. I go, where's City Hall? You're here. <laughs> where's the flag? <laughs> All right. Usually City Hall, they have the city meetings there, you know. Thank you. Here Mr. Was. Stewart. We have a flag, don't we? Thank you, Mayor. Um, <laughs> in my brief talks with uh, Mr. Moran, who just spoke, um, he's uh, indicated to me that he believes that uh, these uh, facilities will be online much more quickly and producing revenue much more quickly, almost uh, in the same time frame as uh, that ballot tax measure would, would produce. Um, the, the gentlemen here making their presentation tonight seem to indicate that they can be breaking ground in January and possibly producing revenue before the end of the year or early in, the, in 2017. Um, and so my, my thought is why, if the council has so much confusion on dates when revenue producing development will commence, doesn't the cup process require a break ground and finish date, or does it? Because if they do, staff should be able to project revenues uh, much more accurately than they're doing. And uh, that would help uh, with uh, putting forward a tax measure to the public, I believe. So if it's not in the cup process, it should be a break ground and finish date so that you can project revenue. Um, my uh, other dumb thought, is that Little Morongo is one of the proposed north-south routes on the internal bike path that's being uh, uh, designed for the city. And I've always thought with the power poles there, and my thought was always that they wouldn't move either, why couldn't you do a serpentine bike path through them and at least use it for that? Um, for that? And then as they proposed, as Mr. Moran proposed, move the street, uh, Little Morongo, expand it into the county with, with uh, you know, with the cooperation of the county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other comments from the public at this time? Hello, Mayor and Council. I'm Susan Miller. I live here. And you have heard about the general plan. I think it's a good time to bring it up. I wish we had a general plan for Little Morongo and the expansion of it. And what exactly to do with the polls and the EIRS or EIRs? Okay, ERs. Well, anyway, uh, I think it's very important to fund the general plan, and I think it could help everything and everybody. And I'm happy the jobs are coming to the city, and that's it. Thank you, Susan. Is there any other comments from the public? 
take one more chance at it. Any more comments from the public? We will close the public hearing, and this is an opportunity for the applicant to rebut anything that was said. I think uh, one thing that's important to remember when he was speaking to the size and stuff, this is a, a 10 year project with 20 buildings. So it's not like we're building the whole million square foot at a time. It's a long term, well thought out development that we want to work directly with you guys to make sure we do this properly. Also, in regards to the security, um, like the gentleman was speaking before, we've met, we're meeting with Alpha 6 Tactical, which is ex SEALs and Secret Service as well as Mike Sana of the Commerce Casino that runs their security to set up our security for out here with the law enforcement. So we're definitely on board with that. So, and then also David might be able to better speak to the, um, some of the other players that we're involved with. Hi, thank you for the time to talk. I'm David Welch, I'm the attorney that helps with a lot of medical marijuana issues here. Um, and I'm gonna address the concern of Washington and DC and the DEA and all of that. Um, maybe the reason Mr. Moran has heard for, about our project is because we have reached out to D.C. This project, we've already spoken to a senator, we've already spoken to a congressman who's very involved in medical marijuana issues who are supporting this project. Before this project gets up and running, we've also reached out to the U.S. Attorney, that's in the Central District, to make sure that they understand what's going on, that what we do is in line with the different memorandums, memoranda or memorandum issued by the federal government. And so we have taken the initiative on our side to not only meet with political officials but also regulators or regulatory uh, bodies as well as law enforcement on the federal level to make sure this project goes through smoothly. Again, what Bernard said earlier, this project will be phased in over a period of time and that's a position that the government feels gov comfortable with as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, we will take city council discussion and questions to staff. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Can we take a five minute recess so that I can get together with staff so they can show me what the street's gonna look like because I'm still not clear and um, my vote's dependent on it. We have multiple items left on the agenda. We're running late tonight. We have other people waiting in the queue. The answer to your questions have been answered that the full payment will be done. What other questions could be answered that you would have to take time to go ask? One other thing too, we can also touch on that in the development agreement too, which we're continuing. Oh, that's what we still have to bring forth. We're, okay. we're just approving the CUP. The development agreement is going to go into more details later. Is it? Do you have anybody in staff that can um, go with me, Martine, right now to show me what this is going to look like? I'll go in the back room. Do you have the plans now? Is there any questions from council? Can I go meet with you back there? I, I, I think Mr. Betts is going to take it upon himself to leave the dais at this time to go find out his questions to his answers that he can't seem to get questioned or get answered. I answer, do have so. one question. Yes, please um, ask it. We have to wait now anyways. <laughs> of the client. Um, when you said there's going to be a thousand jobs, are you indicating those to be construction jobs? Oh, well, if that, it's more than that. I'm talking so for the facility. these are permanent, full-time full -time full -time jobs, jobs at yeah. the facility. Yes. Okay, thank you. Over your 10-year development. Correct. At the end of the 10-year development. Correct, but each each building is about 50 to 60 jobs. Each building, and there's five buildings in your- 20, 20 buildings. The first Well, the first building, so the first phase is four buildings. So first, yeah, first building by the end of uh, 2016 and every six months sequentially after so that. So there'll be 50 employees. So 100 per, per year, basically. And there will be also be external jobs created from that too. I mean, transportation, distribution, all sorts of other stuff that we will be coming online with the, the new Senate bills and assembly bills, so. Councilwoman Zavala. I have uh, two questions. So in regards to the jobs, um, are you suggesting that you would be hiring local Desert Hot Springs residents? Because I think that's very important given that yeah, absolutely. You know, you're in the city. Speaking with Susan about that a lot and creating some sort of training program to get people trained. Most of my employees had never cultivated or done anything before. So it's not, uh, it's not something that's hard for us to, to train in our facilities, so yeah. We can't Tom. have, it's unrealistic to have people coming, driving two hours from 
LA and Orange County to come out here. So. Our Chamber yeah. of Commerce worked a program at one time for one of the new businesses that were opening, doing a local hire, helping with that. So in the future, something yeah. to think about. And we've been talking with Martine about certain things we could do as well. So. And then uh, my second point of clarification was just, um, so I realize you do have 20 buildings and you're building them for basically four buildings at a time. Um, so it's like one building, but, but so there's each, four. Each phase, because you yeah. have to grade that entire phase to, to flatten that, that earth. So that f that's one phase. There's uh, four buildings within that phase. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, how long are you going to, you said six months in between each phase? We could, yeah, we could pump those out probably every six months. Each, each building. building. Each building, so 20 buildings. So every six months you'd be putting out a new building, which a new, grading this new lot, which would hold for? Well, we grade uh, for four buildings at one time. Yeah. So in January we'd grade enough for four buildings. So that no, we're already ready and and do the improvements, street improvements for all those buildings at one time. Great. And then um, as far as the grading, you will only do the grading once you're ready to to build, correct? Yeah. So we we have to grade for those four buildings mm -hmm. in January. We build that first building. Once that's up and running, we start building the one next to it, and so forth. Once we get to the fourth building, we grade that this next section here. and sequentially build, build out. Yeah. Uh, then build. Yeah. then build the phase of the, the timing of the construction is nine months so if we were able to start uh, March 1st we would be paying revenue to the city hopefully in November or December for the first building and that's um, the first building on the first phase yes right. which is three other almost 50,000 square feet so you kind of put the math to it it's close to four hundred thousand dollars so it's gonna take and you nine months to do each building is that what you're looking mm -hmm. at that's what we're looking at well, it can, yeah. d depending on, I mean, that second phase, depending how that first phase goes, we might just build all four buildings at one time. That's why I say on the timing, I probably average out to six months, potentially quicker, but I want to give ourselves a realistic time frame. Also, one thing that was brought up, Bernard will pay better than Walmart. For his <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good to hear. <laughs> At this time, I have no other questions up here. Can staff check on Mr. Betts and see if how much longer he's going to be? If not, I'm going to entertain a motion at this time. <laughs> Sounds like he looks like he's coming. Still got one additional comment. Yes, please make your comment. All right, so it's my understanding that the dirt berm won't be paved, and there'll be, except for the right turn lane into your property, there'll be no improvements along Little Morongo. No, no, Except for deceleration lane and pulling in. <laughs> Curb and gutter, right, sidewalk. I, I, I'm, I'm voting no, okay? So that's it. I'm sorry. I, I can't figure this one out. And or Okay. Well, well, hopefully you'll take some more time and we'll get those questions answered for you. Right now, what's been, been asked by staff from us is to consider the conditional use permit and to approve that. Um, and so I'll take a motion at this time if there's someone that would like to make a motion. Mr. Betts, it does. The answer to the question, could your question has been answered multiple times tonight. All the road improvements will be done in the phase one. The explanation I just got is that the dirt that is at the edge, the existing edge of Little Morongo will not be paved, except where there is a turn into your property. We can pave. We can pave it. To the we can. Pave, we can pave. We can pave everything on that street, and I think that's what we're proposing on the street improvement plans. We don't have them in front of us. We just can't move the poles. So there's going to have to be some sort of mitigation around the poles. So whether they put up K rail, whether they put up some okay. sort of barrier. What's that thing called? K rail. K -rail. Yeah. K -rail. Other cities, if you, it, uh, Brea, Baston Cherry, if any of you guys are familiar, that they've had they've had to keep those K rails uh, for years and so that everybody knows we had a sit down at Coachella Valley with Edison and Martine and we've, we've met with Martine on it. we are talking to them for what we need for the whole valley the, this whole region so Edison's aware of it and we would love to move them but we'll I, I guess what it. I'm saying is what we'll I would do is I would put in the curb gutter sidewalk 
yes. on the, on the street side of the pole, we not will. on the other side of the pole. We will. Not on your project side of the pole, on the street side of the pole. And just put it in. Yes. You can do that if that's how you want it to be. That's what I would do. Oh, and then leave it. Side. And then someday when you're going to move the poles, 10 years from now, you're going to take out curb, gutter, sidewalk, yeah, and it's going to be part of the cost of the project of widening Little Morongo. That's what I would do so that for the next 10 years, it looks like a finished street with a road, a parking area, a curb, landscaping, gutter, and the pole will be to the right of that. That's what I would Councilman do. Councilman Betts, we can do, we can even work on a realignment in that thing with the city. I mean, because the one side of the, the other side of the street's pretty, I mean, we don't have this obstruction. Not at one time, and I think Martine will tell you, and I, and Rich, we have not had one opposition to anything you want. We were here to work with the city, but not, I mean, we were buying more property, and we're invested in your city, and we I'll want to do it right. And, I'm so. sorry with you. I'd like to try and, with the rest of the council, I'd yeah. try and like to work with staff on the, uh, the... The staff has heard all the comments made up here today. I think we're all in agreement that we want, we don't want anything, anybody to turn a vehicle onto dirt to get to your property. Everything needs to be paid from the road to your property, period. It was answered almost 30 minutes ago. I want to move forward with this item at this point. It's been talked to death. Your points are well been taken by city staff, and I think you're not going to have a problem with it at all. That's my opinion. Is there a motion to be put on the table at this point? I would like to move that we approve a conditional use permit 0315 and the development agreement 0415. No, they don't want to develop an agreement at this point. Oh, I'm point. sorry. Okay. Okay. So just a conditional use for a proposed medical marijuana cultivation center totaling 1 million 1,000 1, square foot in multiple buildings in multiple phases on 35.1 acres. The northeast corner of Little Morongo Road and Dillon Road in the Industrial Light District applicant Oxford Properties, Bernard Steinman. Press your button. Is there a second? Is there any more discussion? With no more discussion, please vote. Mr. City Clerk. Motion passes unanimously. All right, move on to item number three, consideration of conditional use permit 05-15 and development agreement 03-15 for cultivation of a 57,907 square foot medical marijuana cultivation facility located on the southwest corner of Two Bunch Palms and Cabot Road in Mr. the light Mayor, industrial. We still need to continue the development agreement to I believe July 19th. I mean January, excuse me. January 19th. Do I have a motion to continue items two's development agreement to January 19th? Motion. So moved. I have a motion and a second. Once it's up on the screen. Oops. Screen just went. Whoops. Oops. Is there any discussion? Please vote. Mr. City Clerk. Motion passes unanimously. All right, moving on to item number three. I've already announced the item. We'll go to the staff report. Senior Planner Rich Malikoff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, tonight we have a, another conditional use permit and a development agreement. This time, <laughs> this time for a project that's on the south west corner of Cabot Road and um, Two Bunch Palm Trails. Doesn't involve Little Morongo at all. <laughs> um, so on this project, basically, we have a much smaller facility, about 60,000 square foot medical marijuana facility in the Light Industrial District. Um, I'll try to go fast given the hour. Um, so here's our site on the corner of Two Bunch Palms and Cabot. Um, it's surrounded by industrial property, so it, the land use is, is correct. This is the site plan. It has um, an attractive building with greenhouses behind it. Um, when you, um, it has, an, the, um, the applicant um, worked with staff on the architecture and the architecture is actually quite nice. Um, what they did was that, um, a very nice corner treatment 
And I wish they had done a rendering where you could look at it from the corner to see what they did. But if you can imagine looking at this rendering um, corner to corner where they did a really nice corner treatment so that people driving by the, the facility will have a very nice view with the slanted roof and the accent colors that they've picked really do create an attractive building. Um, they've also included variable roof lines, plaster finishes, decorative reveals to definitely break up the building along the street frontages. Um, in the landscaping, they've um, picked, these are the earth tone colors that they picked. And in the landscaping, um, the Planning Commission um, had said that they thought it was kind of Spartan and they asked them to improve it. Um, and it was um, looked at again and they did take a positive action on it and they improved it. They hired a local landscape architect to design the facility and they added um, queen palms, low level bougainvillea, yucca and barrel cactus and Palm Springs gold landscape rock. So they have a nice visual presentation. It's um, to soften the architecture and also to add to it. Also using plants that'll make it difficult for um, anybody that might wanna enter for nefarious activities. And um, we're recommending approval on this. And we're also recommending that the development agreement be continued to January 19th so that they can um, work with the city attorney to finalize the details on that. The Planning Commission um, had looked at it. They made some minor changes, which are listed in your staff report on the landscape fingers and the replacement of the chain link with wrought iron. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions of staff at this point? You'll have to just let me know. Yes, Mr. Betts. Okay, do you have a picture that shows the car? You know, in these, in these the, the plans I've seen, it shows me a street view with a car looking at either the headlights or the taillights and showing a pictorial of how the street's going to look. And I've seen that in a, a gazillion plans. A friend of mine's an architect and does this work. I've got another friend who's a draftsman. I've seen his plans. I always put in a street pictorial. That's what's missing. And the street treatment is what's critical to me in all of this. Well, the view that, if we could go back to the PowerPoint, was the street view. I don't know that it's necessary. Doesn't show a car. Doesn't show the car on the street. Uh, yeah, a cross section. So if I could get those included the next time you guys make a presentation, that'll save me all these questions, because that's what I'm missing. I just realized I don't see it. OK? That's what I'm used to looking at. Um, we'll make sure we ask for those. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, the greenhouses, are they going to be open to open air? No, they're not going to be open. They'll be secured, but um, they're, they're going to, I believe they're, they're opaque, right? You're going to be able to see through them. Yeah, there's different kinds of greenhouse products that you can have today, but they're not going to be visible from the street because what they call the offices or the so-called head house will block it. Let me rephrase my question. Are they ever going to open for ventilation? You have to answer that. Um, I will, uh, at this time, why don't you go ahead and uh, I'll invite the applicant to speak. Um, I don't have anybody else in the queue, so go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm John Van Beek, the applicant for the Two Bunch Palm project. And, and what was your question again? My question is, will you <coughs> ever open the greenhouses to ventilate? They will have to be ventilated, yeah. Um, why? For, for air distribution. We need air to flow through these Where plants. do you think the uh, smell is going to go? Well, that, that can be contained through different ozonization uh, filtration systems. So as it does leave the premise, it's ozonated, so you, you won't actually smell it. The problem I'm having with this is that we already approved one greenhouse and I wasn't in the development agreement. I didn't read verbatim word for word, but it was open to open air and for ventilation. Uh, the problem I'm going to have is even though you're far away from a neighborhood, it's going to smell. We know that you can drive around any neighborhood to these days and people with small amounts of plants in their yard, you can smell them. So what's going to stop the school from downwind from smelling your product? Because of the ozonization, there'll be carbon carbon filters. Mm -hmm. So anything that passes through or exiting the building will be conditioned. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you very much. Any other questions for the applicant? 
Just curious, what, what are you going to have in that building that surrounds the greenhouses? Th that's actually an indoor cultivation site. And the way I developed the, the system was that the buildings actually hide the greenhouses. Others I was gonna put up just a regular building and do something that would be exposed. So we thought it best to try to hide the greenhouses. So you're still gonna cultivate? So we're cultivating inside, inside the building? Inside as well? Yes, yeah, that's a cultivation Then we have outdoor. So it's a bit of like solar, right? I know it's just semantics, but we don't allow outdoor cultivation. We consider the greenhouses indoor cultivation. Okay. I know well, that's it isn't, it splitting is, hairs, yeah. but it's not outside cultivation. One would think then, then you just have fields, and we don't allow that. No, we can't allow that because of the, the smell <laughs> from it would, would overwhelm the neighborhoods. Um, is there any questions from council for the applicant? All right, thank you very much. We might have, you can rebut any questions if there's any public comments uh, at this I time. I would like to say one yes. thing. Um, I'm going to, I'm submitting my plans for, for um, uh, planning, to planning right away. But we can probably have this thing up and running within six months. We're a small facility. So in six months, you will get some tax revenue from us. Thank Absolutely. you very much. I'm going to open the public hearing and take public testimony at this time. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak to this item? Please step forward. Anybody in this public would like to speak to this item? Last call. Anybody like to speak for this item? All right. With that, I'll, I'll close the public hearing. This is an opportunity for the applicant to rebut. There's nothing to rebut, obviously. So we're going to move on from that item. City Council discussion and questions to staff. Is there any more questions to staff or City Council discussion? Ms. Parks? Yeah. Um clarify something in my mind. I thought all cultivation were going to be covered warehouses, basically, with no open air greenhouses. Well, the greenhouses are still considered a structure to us. Chapter 5 and also part of the, um, the regulatory permit have reviews for the odor control, and the odor control will be handled through that. Um, the code prohibits them from emitting strong odors, so they have to have the filters in there. Even a warehouse would have some kind of ventilation that no smells could get out. They're going to have to filter that also. But um, we didn't prohibit, the only thing that we did prohibit would be the outdoor growing in the fields. So um, we have many tools at our, including the development agreement, at our disposal to make sure that all these things are gonna be followed. So first we have the development agreement, which is a yearly review. So that would probably be the worst case scenario. So if it did come to that, we don't have to renew the development agreement in the project. We could take legal action on the project that way. We also have our code enforcement. The regulatory permit could be yanked also if they're not following any specific rule, which includes the odor control. And we also have the CUP, and if, if in fact, they're not following the rules, the CUP could also be revoked. I know there's some people in the community that think we could revoke a CUP like in overnight. It does have a process that we have to go through with a public hearing, but it can be done. And, um, and I think those are the five different ways that we could handle the odor control if it were to become a problem. But I think, um, you know, in my notes that I wrote right here, since this, is, this, is, this issue didn't get discussed previously, um, on the Snyder warehouse, which also included greenhouses. So um, what I do is I take notes during these hearings of what the council people's concerns are, and during plan check, we'll make sure that that's documented, um, that the filters are there, and get an explanation as to how the filters will work. Thank you. Is there any questions from council? I have nobody else in the queue. All right, at this time, we'll, we'll close that item and move to adoption of the conditional use permit. Is there a motion? Motion to, motion to approve the conditional use permit at this time uh, by Mr. Betts. Is there a second? You want, you want a motion to approve and, a con and uh, can we do continue it? the... Um, if we can do it all in one motion, I'd love that. Can we do that in all in one motion, Mr. City Attorney? Continue the development uh, agreement uh, consideration until second meeting in... And the mitigated negative deck. So approve the conditional use permit and uh, continue the development agreement till the 19th of January. Mm -hmm. There's a motion. Is there a second? 
please vote. Mr. City Clerk. Motion carries unanimously. All right, moving to the administrative calendar, item number four, the three-year and five-year cash flow analysis for the Consolidated General Fund Administrative Services Director, Joseph Tanner. Almost feels like I've been here since three o'clock. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is our cash flow projection model that we've uh, we developed. Just to give everyone a little background, uh, this was part of the uh, the recommendation of the of Urban Futures as part of the uh, five-year financial plan, and this report allows us to to get a handle on. Uh, on what our cash issues um, are with the city. In the past, there's been uh, a number of times where cash flow has definitely been an issue. And so we hope to uh, address that uh, and make sure everyone is well aware of, uh, of any pitfalls that may be upcoming in the next, in the next couple of years. So some of, our, some of our assumptions and notes, you know, we're just, we're, uh, we're basically gonna keep Doing what we're doing, we're going to bring uh, a number of items forward uh, relating to the to the five-year financial plan, and and this is one of them to stay on top of and and keep the council informed. We're going to keep doing priority-based budget uh, like we did before. Uh, we're still going to recommend a contingency, although we can uh, recommend a much smaller one now that we uh, that we have a little bit more cushion, uh, a little bit more padding, uh, and then. A uh, couple of other things uh, regarding this report. We're not uh, predicting any kind of economic uh, downturn in the next in the next couple of years. I think that uh, we're probably coming due for one in the in the near future. Uh, no one really knows when. I think that you know the prognosticators and and uh, certain other folks are are saying that. Uh, this upcoming year is, is going to be a little bit up and down in regards to the stock market, but we're not, no one's really predicting any, uh, any real estate bubble bursting or, or any kind of uh, rise in unemployment or, or anything like that. Uh, what this does take into account is our recent development. Uh, we've been very robust in, in that uh, section of revenue. Uh, our sales tax uh, at best will be flat, uh, most likely negative, and will continue negative until the price of gas uh, returns to, to where it was. Uh, we're doing pretty modest projections with property tax uh, ongoing. We just got word from, from the Riverside County that they are actually, their assessment is only gonna go up uh, one and a half percent. Of course, that doesn't include properties that have turned over but uh, you know, going forward, one and a half percent is is pretty modest, and we're also uh, looking at uh, the unemployment rate, and we expect that to be to be flat. Even though uh, our unemployment uh, is down relative to the city, however, compared to the rest of California, is still is still pretty high. We're also not projecting any marijuana cultivation taxes. Uh, the reason for that is. Until there is uh, shovels in the ground and they're building it, we're not going to predict uh, those revenues coming into the city. Uh, I've seen a number of projects fall through for any number of a thousand reasons, uh, and that's why we're we're not uh, including those in in our projections. And then also the, just uh, of note, uh, the city has gotten some one-time revenues uh, this year and in the past and we have to take those out for, for on, ongoing uh, projections. Uh, just to keep in mind, cash balance is not fund balance. Fund balance takes into account assets, liabilities, uh, developer deposits, payables, payroll, uh, encumbered money, whereas this report is strictly cash. So at any given time, the city is holding on to cash that is either a deposit, uh, we have to make payroll every two weeks, 
uh, but for the purpose of this report, cash is king. And then we're also assuming that we're gonna remain service insolvent. So this is our previous cash trend that, uh, that was presented to the council. And as you can see, we predicted uh, on June 30th, 2015, where we're gonna have about two and a half million dollars uh, in the bank cash, not fund balance. And we were predicting to go negative uh, by, by uh, the end of the fiscal year in 20, 2018 and continue on a downward, uh, downward trend. Uh, the breakdown for this updated uh, cash flow model has been much more positive. Uh, we're expecting 5.2 million at the end of this fiscal year, 5.26 million at the end of next fiscal year, and 5.1 million at the end of fiscal year 17, 18. So a much, much different uh, projection from, from previously. Uh, if we put that on, uh, on a graph, as you can see, it's really no, uh, no secret. I think the last cash projection was uh, a similar line. It was just pointed in a different direction. So what this says is, you know, we are reliant on those, uh, those big payments from the county twice a year. And you can see those, those spikes are those payments. And then as we continue to draw down, then it, our, our cash goes down. And uh, that's the blue line. The second dark line, that's a little flatter is the moving average of our, of our cash. So if you compare the two, uh, it's looking much different. You know, we see a spike uh, and that's just due to, you know, the one-time revenue we've, we've gotten this year. We've also had a very good first quarter. Uh, the second quarter so far is looking, is looking very well, but over time, uh, which is uh, a concern for me, is that there is still a downward trend in our cash position. So what changed? Why, why the, big, uh, the big swing? So for one is we've reduced our budget. Uh, our budget was 14.7, now it's 14.3. You know, in the past, the city's eliminated a number of positions and uh, salary cuts, we've also had major salary savings due to vacant positions and turnover, and that's reflected in, uh, in the first quarter. And then also our improving local economy. We've had uh, a lot of cultivators come in and we've been collecting planning fees, building fees uh, on those projects, which have helped, uh, helped us out tremendously. So just our, our risk assessment, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we have to consider all factors, positive and negative, uh, when we look at any kind of projection. So on the, on the good side, at any one time, we have a three to six month cash contingency. So if all revenue stopped right now, we'd have between three and six months cash to, to get through, which is, which is very positive. And again, because, uh, because we have that little bit of a cushion, our contingency in future budgets will be, will be reduced, or could be reduced. Uh, again, no marijuana cultivation. Uh, some of the, but it hopefully will come, hopefully will be coming very soon, and once those numbers, uh, or once we start generating that revenue, it'll be reflected in an updated cash, cash model. Uh, one concern is our ongoing expenses are outpacing our ongoing revenues. So the city, and especially this year and the, and the previous year, we've, we've balanced the, the budget on, on one-time revenues. And even those building and planning fees that we are collecting, which has been very positive, those are considered one-time revenue and will run out eventually. I think they'll be strong for some time uh, based on, on future projects that we've heard happening, but until that money you know, comes in, then you know, we'll just kind of have to take it one, one step at a time. Uh, CalPERS is kind of the ugly. So our, our CalPERS is, uh, is going to be our, our big, our big uh, issue in next year and then upcoming years. And that is due to a couple of reasons. Number one is CalPERS has, uh, CalPERS collects their revenue from three different sources. Uh, what they get from employees, public sector employees, 
and their return on investment, and then what they collect from cities. And CalPERS has kind of a fatal flaw right now because more people are going uh, out of CalPERS and retiring than coming into CalPERS. So there's a difference there. And CalPERS has a 30-year projection on their, on their investment targets. So they are going from uh, a 7.5% return on investment to a 6.5% return on investment. So in the, in, the long run, in the long run for CalPERS, it will stabilize them and kind of pad them uh, for any future recessions, but in the short term, there's going to be uh, a difference in the money that they need to collect. And the only other source of revenue that they have to do that is through what they build the cities. They also start, started charging for unfunded liability. And so my, uh, my retirement, for example, other city employees' retirement, uh, they, they run a calculation that says, you know, I make so much a year, and I have so many, they assume I have so many years left of service, or in so many years within CalPERS, and that is the uh, liability portion, unfunded liability portion, so they started charging for that, uh, which is, been uh, pretty sizable, and I expect that number to, to grow. We've had so much uh, savings and salary that we've been able to, to cover that for the time being, but you know, going forward, I do expect that to, to increase. Uh, ongoing risk, uh, one, natural disasters are always going to be a, a risk moving forward. There's always that possibility that uh, a heavy storm is going to come through and, and wash out a road. Uh, although we don't have any major pending lawsuits at the time at this time you know that may change in the next year two years three years depending on how things kind of play out and, and what happens uh, and then also downturns in the economy and recessions and I have on little note on here first in and last out and what's happened in communities such as desert hot springs that are uh, you know that have low income they're disenfranchised communities that really they're the first into the recession and they stay in the recession longer than anybody and they're the last out of the recession. And I'll point to a, an example, uh, for instance, uh, a region like the Silicon Valley, which is a very affluent community and very desirable, they did have a recession. It was a very short one and they were in and they were out. And then also one, one of the, another ongoing risks is also our uh, expiring uh, tax measures. So we have to consider that uh, in any planning, any planning moving forward, which makes it very difficult to do any, any long-term planning with uh, you know, a, five million, a loss of $5 million uh, looming moving forward. So that concludes, oh, and just in summary, uh, overall, there's a much more, I have a much more positive outlook uh, with this model. Uh, the draft audits, we've seen some of the, the financial numbers and that is going to be uh, reflected in our, in our fund balance that is going up. Uh, and then we're going to, based on this report and our, our audit, we're going to be coming back at uh, mid-year and we're going to be able to uh, free up some of that cash that we've collected and, and uh, make some recommendations and, and ask for council direction with probably uh, sometime in January or February. Uh, and at this time, I can, uh, I, can, I can say with confidence that we are not recommending a uh, fiscal emergency and that we just need to stay focused and improve and grow the local economy and city finances. And uh, some of this is gonna be addressed in the, in the mid-year budget and also our, our, our goal setting session that we're planning on having is a couple of ideas that we've kind of talked about is infrastructure financing districts, pavement management plans, and then also working on some public uh, private partnerships when, when they become available. And that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, this basically technically starts our budgeting process for the next fiscal year. Uh, one of the questions I had when I took over as mayor was do we need to uh, declare a new fiscal emergency to get through this fiscal year, but staff was pretty confident we did not. They met with each of the council members and went over the cash flow, and this, so this is the beginning of the process. Now, next month, we'll begin the uh, budget workshops. 
uh, mid-year, starting with mid-year and getting a, a report from our financial consultant, Michael Bush, and then working out a budgeting schedule uh, from that point on. So that's my plan. I have one council member in the queue, Mr. Betts. Thank you. Okay, so we're way better off than we were when we found we had, what, $450, $420 left in our bank account in April of, what was that? Jeez, it's all blurring together. Two months, April 2000, whatever the year is, <coughs> 13, 14. Thank you. And um, so we're showing, you know, the, the uh, 5.2 million is the projection that we will end up with on June 30th, 2016. So that's a really, really good improvement. Um, I was saying for the last few months that we were going to end up at 4.5, and I had people tell me we were crazy. Um, this is a really wild swing um, to go to 5.2. Now, what's critical here to keep in mind is that we don't have a whole bunch of money to start spending. We're still very deficient in a lot of areas, and one of them is in reserves. This 5.2 includes reserves. And our reserves should be 5.2, which means that we're still not in a good position here. Um, so we got to start thinking about putting some money off into a dedicated reserve like we were talking about before. Um, take, take half of this and put it in a dedicated reserve that requires um, action of the council, separate action of the council to pull it back out. You can access it at any time you want to, but um, it's one of the things we need to look at. The um, other thing is we're spending our streets. We don't have an active uh, paving plan. If you take a drive up Palm Drive, starting down by Dillon and all the way up, it's all getting bad. And lots of streets in the city are getting into alligatoring, and on the index, they're getting bad. And we're spending them, and we need to put some money into paving, and we gotta figure out where that money's coming from. And uh, we can't let that go forever. So there's a lot of stuff here that, you know, while this is really, really welcome news, I don't think anybody should be sitting there saying, let's go back to the party. And I'll say this, like I've said a bunch of times, let's go the time. The cities that have gotten themselves in trouble, that have gotten themselves back into trouble, have gotten back into trouble because they went back to their ways. They thought, okay, we're out of the crisis, let's spend. The, the temptation to start spending like crazy takes over and they get themselves right back in trouble and you can go find cities that have done that. Um, and just on the way, I think we're still waiting for this economy to come back. It seems like a whole lot better than it did when that crash, but that was a heck of a crash that we went through. We're still not back yet. So, okay, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. I have nobody else in the queue. If there's nobody else in the queue, I don't see anybody else going for their button. We'll receive and file. Thank you for the report, Mr. Tanner. Move on to item number nine, which is the request for proposal for legal services. Our city attorney, city manager, Martin Magana. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of the council, uh, as you know, uh, back in December, or for the new council members, maybe you don't know this, but in December of 2012, a city council entered into a legal services agreement with Green, Dubornowski, and Quintanilla uh, to provide legal services for the city. And as you know, since then, subsequent to that execution, Mr. Quintanilla has left the employee of the firm. He started his own firm. And uh, at that point, the council agreed to keep him as our city attorney and directed staff to prepare a new legal services agreement, uh, which the council did approve on July of 2014. So in total, I mean, you know, Steve's been the city attorney for really three years coming out in this month. And as council policy has been, um, contracts should go out again for RFP every three years. And so we're pretty much coming up on that deadline. Uh, so uh, I'm asking that the city council authorize me to issue a request for proposals to solicit bids for legal services. And then we will bring that back to the council um, to review the um, the proposals and uh, set up interviews and see how council wants to go. Um, you do recall um, during the our fiscal crisis um, and when we renegotiated our contract with Steve, 
Uh, he lowered his retainer fee from thirty-five to twenty-five thousand dollars, and he also provided a list in your packet on page six twenty-nine, a list of services that he was going to do at pro bono. Um, <clears throat> um, so, with that, uh, the current fiscal year has has money in the budget to cover the cost, you know, uh, for his contract. But um, with your authorization, I will release an RFP and then um, come back with a recommendation for council. Um, thank you for the report. I spoke with the city manager adhering to our policies, which is that all contracts go out for bid after three years. I think this meets those requirements. Um, Mr. Kidney, I would assume, would be putting in a proposal. And then uh, with, those, uh, with that proposal, uh, I did make it clear to the city manager that we had to put the specialized services out there. Mr. Kidney has offered many specialized services through his firm, or they're both firms that he that he's represented. Uh, we had to make sure that those are covered in the RFP. So with that, I have one person in the queue to speak, Mr. Betts. Quick question, Mr. Kidney, have you looked at this? Is this all that you provide now? Is, this, is there anything missing? Just, or maybe I'll ask the city manager, did you review this? to take into account what we're already getting? Yeah, th this is what was in his contract. Okay, is there anything missing or? Specific? One of the things that, we, that we're adding is, um, uh, there was three items. One was the medical marijuana cultivation, um, uh, HR, human resource, um, legal advice, and then the other one was the receivership program that we've been discussing for some time now. You tell me about HR. Uh, just on uh, human resource issues, um, uh, consulting staff and providing legal assistance on any HR issues that uh, deal with, could be staffing, it could be litigation, it could be, there's a number of issues. We have a full-time HR employee now, manager, city employee? Uh, part-time. Only part-time? Yeah. Pam, Pam is part time. And a oh, and then you got Joe as a director of that whole department. But uh, somebody working specifically on HR issues is just part time. Schooled HR manager, keeping up to date on everything. Yes, all our trainings, um, all the legal stuff that we need to push forth, um, sexual harassment, etiquette, uh, all this other training that we have to do. Uh, keeps an eye on that and gives us reminders as to when we have to do all that. Um, and then working with the city attorney, uh, I'm, I'm assuming we'll have some new training coming up also regarding uh, the, um, what is it, uh, new council members, um, ethics, ethics, ethics orientation. I think you get that up at the... Get yeah. online or the league. At the league. Do you have any other specific questions? That's it. All right, and the reason that it's come to the city council is because there's three employees that the city council oversees, and this is one of them, so you, the city manager must have permission from the city council to move forth with this. Is there a motion to uh, authorize the city manager to issue a request for proposal to solicit bids for legal services? I move that we uh, accept city recommendation, staff recommendation. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. I forgot my own process here. I'll open it up for public comments. Anybody like to speak on this item? Push the button, Lou, Lou, push the button there, it's not on. Sorry. Uh, since uh, Mr. Quint Quint Quintanilla's uh, um, contract was um, altered and renegotiated last year, it would seem that the three, year would be, three years would be 2017. Um, and it's odd that you would be putting out an RFP for legal services um, um, when earlier in the agenda we didn't need it for a $144,000 expenditure. So I'm uncertain why, uh, unless Mr. Quintanilla has expressed um, an inability to keep providing services at the rates that Desert Hot Springs is paying him. It would be very unusual if any other firm could come in and uh, bid lower than pro bono, which is uh, pretty much what Mr. Quintanilla has been providing for Desert Hot Springs. Uh, two years ago when the city teetered on the verge of bankruptcy, only two contractors stepped up and voluntarily cut their fees, Michael Bush of Urban Futures and Mr. Quintanilla. Others sued the city to maintain their unsustainably high salaries. 
Uh, Steve Quintanilla showed his legal expertise by having the declaration of fiscal emergency upheld in court, and that allowed the council time to make the difficult cuts that averted bankruptcy. Um, he then designed the ordinances on medical marijuana dispensaries and cultivation that will guarantee fiscal stability for Desert Hot Springs in the long run. Desert Hot Springs should be putting up a statue of Mr. Quintanilla for his exemplary service rather than uh, uh, putting him up for an RFP. Um, his generosity to numerous local causes is well documented. So I would ask you to table this at least until uh, Mr. McKee gets back. So again, that he consider, can consider this. And I would really ask you to consider the wisdom of uh, putting, uh, making Mr. Quintanilla jump through hoops after all he's done for this city. Thank you. Mr. Betts. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I'd just like to make a comment based on the, the comments that were made right now. We're, we're in our comments now. Uh, I, I appreciate everything Mr. Quintanilla has done for the city. Um, for some reason, people will stand up there and say you didn't follow your policy of, of three years, and then other times they say they're doing a good job, you don't need to follow your policy. So when is it that we follow our policies? Um, I believe that Mr. Kitney has served this community for three years and should go off RFP. I also believe he'll probably be the lowest bidder again. So um, I'm just trying to adhere to our policies and keep things moving forth as the, uh, the mayor and the city manager has followed in that. Um, this is in no place uh, not to build a statue in, in your favor, so I guess we'll start putting together some metal and, and we'll start uh, uh, melting it so that we can form a statue of Mr. Cantonia. Would you like it outside the doors here or would you? No? I was just gonna, hoping that we could, I was just hoping we could put the suit that you wore in the parade on it. Would that be okay? No, I'm not yeah, doing We could get Karen Barone to do one of those sculptures she does. So with that, is there a motion? There is a motion on the table. Is there a second? Going once. I will second the motion. And is there any other discussion? Please vote. Please read the vote. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you very much. With that said, we're going to come to the end of our meeting. We actually have legislative updates, which we have nothing on that item. There is a new legislative update from the state of California that I'm going to bring forth at the next meeting at the League of Cities um, that could affect our city. Uh, public comments, we do have multiple public comments left, but I don't see anybody left in the room that would be speaking to those public comments. There's only two people. I know both their names, and neither one is on the public comment list. Uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we'll see you in 2016. Thank you. We are adjourned.